Hello. Welcome. Hey. What's up, everybody? <clears throat> Analysis stream. Gather around, little children. Let me fix my board. Window capture. Yeah, it's better. Move 11. Percy. Percy, the tank engine. <clears throat> um. No, wait. That's Thomas. Whatever, there was some character in the Thomas the Tank Engine. Weird stuff coming back to me. Um, all right. Percy Hepworth. Move 11 may or may not be here. Acerbate, sire. I just want to say, like, we had a false positive on the donation bar. Nils, uh, Nils donated for lessons, but it's actually not a donation, so Nils has, Nils has falsely driven our, our donation bar higher than it should be. It's actually a 30 something, around $30, essentially, not 90. All right, so we're doing game analysis tonight, <coughs> Thursday night. Yesterday there was no stream. I'm, I'm canceling Wednesday streams, by the way. I'm no longer going to stream on Wednesday mornings. It's always been a bad day for my stream. My time is bad, and it's just really not not a good turnout. So we're just gonna we're gonna stick with five streams a week: Monday, Friday morning, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday nights. Um, so five streams a week. It'll give me a more balanced break. You know, every Wednesday and Saturday, kind of even it out. All right, Astrid, are you with us? Instructive analysis. Um, we can't see the names on the board. You guys can't see. Yeah, you can see that. Really tiny though. Look how tiny it is. Brother, you are my Luke, you are my brother. Luke. I have a new tag for my streams, not for idiots. Just I figured I'd just put it out there. If you're an idiot and you know you are, just don't even watch my stream, okay? It's totally not for you guys who are idiots. If, if you are an idiot and you're aware of the fact that you're an idiot, just stop watching now, okay? <laughs> All right, this is funny. Ha -ha. What if I'm not sure if I'm an idiot? Um, Cutie the Roblox Bunny. And acerbate. Bijak. Are you going to be playing in uh, in Shredderjevic tournaments? In Serbia? Didn't you play last year? There's the Arang Dobash or whatever. It sounds like Hungarian. The Golden, golden Horsey. Go, golden... Golden Horsey Tournaments. I felt like he organized it before. It's some nice hotel. <clears throat> I was just notified on Facebook. All right, the Golden Horsey Open or something. So, and, and also Adelik said he's going to Serbia for a lot of rapid tournaments. Yeah, uh, yeah, Iran. Aran, Aran Lobach, you know, this means like, in Hungarian, it's like golden horse or something like that. Golden, golden, golden horseman or golden horse. Something like that. It's basically bastardized Hungarian. Um, that's what it means. Aran Lo Lobach. Golden Horsey. So, all right, guys, we're gonna start analyzing some games here. Um, we don't have to do my game first. I I put my own game in there because we we kept getting requests to see my games from the World Senior Championship, and uh, I didn't you know show any. So <clears throat> I figure it, at some point in the middle of the stream, I'll take a break and, and show you guys one of my games. 
I've got games from Astrobate, Schumacher, Mule Skinner. Who else have I missed? Move 11. Um, that's the turn I was talking about, B Jack. Yeah. Move 11. Anyone else I forgot? Mule Skinner. All right. That's it. So we don't have a lot of submissions thus far. I'm sure that some will come in. <clears throat> it means like Town of Archangel Michal. Really? Oh, that's weird. It's funny, as, as a Hungarian resident, it looks exactly like Golden Horsey in Hungarian. Um, that's funny. Maybe there's some... Illuminati going on here. What if there's what if there's a relationship? The Archangel Michael really means golden horsey. Um town, but how does the Mihail get in there? I don't understand. Oh I, that means the whole thing means town Archangel Mihail, but where, where's Mikhail? I don't see the Mikhail there. Michael um, all right, Astrobate versus Eduardo. That's not the right game. Astrobate, where's your new game? Your grandparents and father are from that town, and I was born there. Oh, just coincidentally, I was born in that town. Well, I guess you would know. B Jack was just coincidentally born in this place that I'm talking about. What are the chances? You know, there's like thousands of towns in Serbia. <laughs> like, what's the chance? It's the exact town where you were where you were born. I mean, kind of statistically low. Um. All right, it's a small world. Ask me. Bring it up. We'll start with Schumacher's game then. Schumacher, you know you're not allowed to submit your games against me. Yeah, I never even knew my grandparents, man. My parents were so old when I was born. My parents were like 40 and 47, respectively, when I was born. So, my, my grandparents all passed away before I was even born. No, I mean, I know you sent me five games. I know you sent me five games, but you specifically said you, you should can start with the first one, you know, and this is the first one. But I don't mind going over this game. I was talking about it with Move 11. Because he had another game, he had a game with you as well. That was actually kind of a little similar. Actually, okay, it wasn't that similar. It was the same classical. But I mentioned this against him. Because he had... You have to leave two, so you can go in any order. Well, anyway, I'm going to go over this. But we're going to look at the game from your perspective, and um, seeing the board from your opponent's perspective is a very interesting thing. I'm not going to write a blog about it, because I don't want to be Captain Obvious, but um, there's enough of those already. Classical Nimzo, I have played myself with white, but... I actually kind of stopped because it's just very theoretical. You know it pretty well, but um, I wouldn't play classical Nimzo these days without doing some pretty heavy study. It is considered by many to be the most topical variation against the Nimzo. Move 11 Castle. You know, and then the thing about this variation is is really the critical line is the one that you never play you know which is e4 now it turns out that it it might not be the best for white but it's it leads to incredible complications so after e4, if you play e4, and we get d5, e5, and this line is really wild. Knight e4, 
there's a bunch of correspondence games, and I've seen pretty high-level games, and it's so complicated, yet I had a correspondence game online where it ended in a draw. It was like, by the time we got out of book, it was already a draw, you know? In correspondence, you can use the, the opening book. And it's like, this line is so sharp, and there's so many games that have been analyzed, that by the time you get, you get out of theory, it's already practically a draw. So, all right. But, you know, you play knight f3. The other moves are a3 and bishop g5. You know, I don't know if... I mean, the main line was really a3 forever. I used to play a3. I mean, obviously, a3 takes time, and, uh, I mean, there's, there's like, a lot of variations you have to know, too, with a3, because a3 gives black a really wide variety of, of choices, obviously. a3 takes is forced, usually white takes with the queen, and now black has, like, a billion moves, you know, like, literally, look to open explorer. Queen e8 is a variation. I don't know if I was even aware that queen e8 was a move here. You know, Adorian used to play B5 <clears throat> back in the day. Rip Andras Adorian, who passed away this year. But he was a great theoretician and contributed a lot to to various openings. Um, question mark. What's the point of knight knight e4? To play f5, usually. I had a friend who had that game, you know, he had the Fermi and played this against him, knight e4. They play knight e4 and f5 usually. That's the point of knight e4. Oh, queen e8. Well, it's pre preventative, you know, getting out of the pin. Pre preemptive uh, removal of pin. There's also this. But anyways, alright, so you don't play a3, you don't play b um, e4. And you don't play bishop g5. Did you ever play bishop g5 against me? Because I had the feeling like maybe you did. I had the feeling you, you actually had played this move previously in some games against me. Let me see. Player, side g, black, sparkle horse says black. A me boy, good time, no norm, sir, no norm, sir. A me boy, Schumacher, yeah, see, Schumacher, Schumacher, 2021. So this was a line you did play before. And, you know, it's kind of so, possible transitions to to the Rogozin after d5. Um, I don't know if e5, e4 is better, Shaki. It's, it's like, you know, I talked about this already. It's like a, very, very complicated variation that ends in like a forced draw. At the top levels, e4 may not even be a good move because it's essentially leading to like 30 move draws and stuff. But, um, good is uh, also a relative term. Uh, is There's like objectively good and there's like mathematically best according to the computer, but they're not necessarily the same thing, you know? What what is objectively best isn't necessarily you know the best move according to the computer, or whatever. What is practically best is a different question altogether. Um, so bishop g five. Well, that's wild. You know, I've never lost in this line. Not like okay, I'm playing average rating players who are around two thousand, but still, I mean, I'm I'm undefeated. Feels good. It feels good to be undefeated as black here in 29 games. Um, what about bishop g5, though? I have eight games with no losses. Yeah, I don't play this line that much for black, though. I don't play I don't play castles all that often. Um, okay, castles. Bishop g5, c5, by the way. I prefer c5. The computer may prefer d5. How I never won. 
How I never won. Well, actually, Schumacher, I don't know, but you never, um, I don't play castles that much. You've beaten me in other variations. I don't play this line that much for black. Bishop g5. Okay, so knight f3, and now I played, um, d6. But so move 11 played d5 against you, right? In the tournament on Tuesday? Did he not? This, this really, like, has a Rogozin feel to it now after d5. So it looks like I played it against you last year. Obviously, I don't remember that particular game, but I normally don't like to play d5 type structures. If I wanted to play d5, I would play the freaking Queen's Gambit on move one. You know, that's my general feeling about the Nimzo. I, I generally try to avoid playing d5. I feel like I play better in more flexible pawn type of formations. I saw I play c5, b6, d6, whatever. Um, but, you know, the computer, I think, says d5 is the best move. It's also, okay, a very fundamental move. Um, you could transpose to a type of Catalan, couldn't you? Like g3. No game found. Wow, it's that bad. Okay, queen on c2 is not too good here. Yeah, I take it back. You can't play g3, it's too slow. Okay, so I played d6 against you, and then we transposed to a lynchage type of formation, and I expected you to play... I don't know what I expected you to play. I expected you to play bishop g5 or something. There's also like this. This is not very inspiring. Um, there's also this weird idea of h3. I had a strange feeling that, that on, uh, Atzel Gergo had a game with Lynchich where, where Lynchich played h6 and, and Gergo played like h3. Didn't happen. Or maybe the game's not in the database. I don't remember. h3 is obviously a stupid move for white. But he could support a g4 type of push later on. Um, let's see. G4 was played. I'm not recommending this move. Maybe for bullet. So, you played now against me this. Which is weird. I thought this was a very surprising move. I mean, I've set up a pawn chain with d6. It seems like the least logical place to put the bishop on f4 when I have a solid pawn chain with d6 set up, you know? If I played c5 or I just had the pawn back on d7, you're like kind of asking for it, you know, in like an old Indian type of structure for me to push e5 with tempo. Not to say it's that easy, but I'm just saying in general, you know, that's why not too many people have played this. There's two games here, a Dolmatov game from 1983 and Munkal, who I played here, a Mongolian IM against Kasimjanov. Now, Bishop f4, what was I thinking? Um, Bishop g5 I expected you to play, which is more natural. Black's castled, by the way. So, it's not so easy to play like g5. I... I would go for a c5 type of setup if possible. Is there some reason I can't play c5 here? Can you play h6 and c5, for example? Why, why is this not an option? I know there's other ways to play, like knight on bd7 or whatever, but... Well, maybe h6 is more useful. If I play bishop g5, h6, of course you could be like a caveman and do that. Again, not recommended. Bishop h4. Now c5. Why is c5 not a move? Ivan Isovich has a game. I would think this wouldn't be that bad for black. So he just plays e3.
Now I guess black could try maybe b6, bishop b7. If b6. There's no gains, but I think it's like playable for black. dc5, bc5. It could get very sharp though. I mean, you'll have play here. There's the g4 type of stuff. This is not the safest position, not the safest line for black. So anyway, I like bishop g5 better for you. You know, I mean, it feels like that's... Okay, this is probably black's best. Now e3. Now we have some kind of relatively common position. What am I supposed to do, though? b6? Kasparov Karpov, 1985. Well... That's one I was, I missed that one. I mean, I was just like literally going to my first chess tournament. Or around then. Feingold Tukmakov, 1994. Where the heck did Feingold play Tukmakov in 1994? That's weird. Um, all right. I wonder if Tukmakov like, came to the World Open or something. If he came to the United States and played. Anyway, okay, this is a solid setup. I'm, I'm going a little too far afield here trying to study the opening. I'm sorry, guys. So anyway, we're here to analyze the games. I'm, I'm sorry for getting, getting too involved in the opening theory. But I'm just saying, like, you know, Schumacher should really consider, like, a different move here. I think Bishop F4 is kind of odd, you know. All right, so... Two very strong players with black in my position both played knight on bd7. You know? Which completely makes sense to push for, you know, an e5 type of thing. The advantage of, of Kostimjanov and Domatov playing knight on bd7 is that they don't they don't make the commitment to b6 that I made. You push this is also the way Alinchic beat me in the Hungarian team championship three years ago. I, I mean, in a similar position. I was. I also put my bishop on f4 in a weird, in a weird way. But I played like an absolute maniac and and got killed. It was like my first tournament game in months and months and months and months and months. I think in nineteen. It was in two thousand nineteen. Or early 2020. Um, early 2019. I think I hadn't played for six months. And I played like a maniac and lost with white. But this doesn't commit to b6. Interesting move. Uh, I played b6, so this is also playable. But with, with knight on bd7, maybe you're going to put the knight there no matter what. All right, so knight, knight b7. This is a new move, b6, e3, bishop b7. And then I was surprised here when you didn't play bishop d3. I thought you would play bishop d3 and really fight for control of e4. Um, Arthur Bernard Bisgeier and Mok Trong Sun. Two players I have played. Um, multiple times each. I span the generations. Um, all right. So I expected bishop d3 from you. You know, bishop b2 is kind of passive, and you're not fighting for control of e4. Also, I mean, this diagonal seems... I mean, are you seriously thinking I'm going to take on f3? Would I do that? Would I do something like that? Do I look crazy to you? You played bishop e2, and I was very happy that you played bishop e2, because it's kind of passive. Um, you'll skin her welcome. Alright. Guys, we're sharing um, analysis games. Shocky! Shocky has left the building. Um, if you are a subscriber to the stream, or you'd like to be a subscriber, Beg in the in the stream for a subscription. 
And um, if you are a subscriber, you can submit a game for, for tonight's analysis stream. I'm here for the next two hours. Um, we've only got four games so far, so I'm more than happy to accommodate a few other subscribers. If not, I'll have to go over my games, which is really boring. Um, no. So now, after Bishop B2, I, I couldn't resist being, you know, Nimzovich, trying to Nimzovich style this position here. I mean, I kind of abandoned the whole plan of, of E5, and I went for Nimzovich in control of E4. So I played Knight E4. I mean, this is definitely, you know, I'm going to inflict doubled pawns on you. You castle, I take with the bishop, you take back with the pawn. And now knight d7. Now I think that I've played perfectly. You've played okay. The only thing about your position is that the bishop on f4 is a little bit of a... I mean, obviously you have doubled pawns, but I mean, that's kind of standard Dimzo affair. This, this bishop on f4 looks like it could get trapped. But you play knight d2, which is best. You know, the standard maneuver. I take the knight, you take, and now I don't know what I should do. This is a relatively fast high control. I played the obvious move, e5. There's the famous game, Rubinstein Nimzovich, I think. There were several Nimzovich games. But I mean, the standard setup is something like queen e7, f5, you know. And we're pushing like f4 if possible. That's basically what I'm doing here. And then all of a sudden, you went here, which is a good move. And I, I started looking at the position and thinking about the fact that I'm looking at f5, but I, um, I was d deterred by f4. But I was reevaluating this the other day um, thinking about how I could have played this game better and I think there was something about like c5 is bad for sure y you played rook a e1 I played rook a d8 not a bad move f4 c5 this is probably not great What's the definition of miniature? I, <clears throat> I'm gonna say under 20 moves. I don't know. John Curto could have told you, but he died. He used to always put miniatures in the Boston Globe. I managed to get one in there, a couple. I had a couple. But Curto usually went for under 20. But maybe you're right, maybe it's 15. But okay, let's say I play f5. And you play f4, now what do I do? If I play knight f6, you have bishop h4. And white's okay, I think. I'm trying to make your bishops, your bishop or bishops bad here. The problem is if I push e4, my bishop's bad too. And your, your darkster bishop has potential to get out there. Maybe I can play bishop a6, though. You know, I have something like bishop a6, queen f7, attacking your c4 pawn, trying to put pressure on your c4 pawn. Actually, bishop a6 is a very effective plan. I mean, obviously, your position would be a lot better if your pawn structure was, was b2, not c3. But, um, but I think here, you know, rook a d8 really doesn't do anything. And then f4... This is kind of my point, but it's like hope chess. You know, well, what am I doing here? I'm go are you going to do this and like open up the, the D file? That's not happening. I mean, that's what happened in the Nimzovich game. Rubinstein Nimzovich. Or Nimzovich, yeah. In the Nimzovich game, the one I'm remembering, which, which was very famous for this type of structure, I mean, Black ended up using this D file. They had several games, but um, this is why I put my rook on d8 anyway. But it wasn't well thought out, you know. I think c5 is a mistake from me. 
Um, rook d8 is a mistake. c5 is a mistake. But what should I have done? Instead, f5, probably f3 or f4. Well, there's actually a game here. Who would have thunk it? The check Grandmaster Stochek drawing with black against the 2400. Exact position. Wonders never cease. So I should play f5. Um, this is bad. This is bad. And then you played f5. <sighs> and here, like, the computer hated my next move. Lasting 25 moves or fewer. Because chat GPT knows everything. F5. What The computer wanted to play something else for black here. Is it this again? Um, like, I panicked too early, but I was afraid of F6. I mean, this is a serious threat. I mean, seriously, no, F6 is a serious threat. Isn't it? I mean, if I... If I just do, like, a random move... Whatever. Let's say that. Not that random, actually. Let's say Bishop A8, I don't know. F6. Knight takes F6, Bishop H4. You know, it may turn out that I have some kind of miracle, you know, like knight e4, bishop takes, knight takes. When your rook is trapped, I'm going to win back the exchange or something. So I made this move too quickly, and now I have no space. The plan was to bring my king over here, evacuation. Standard procedure in this type of structure. You take space, now you have a huge space advantage. Now here, I think... The other thing the computer said I should have done, which I, I, I looked at, of course, but I felt was unnecessary, was to play, obviously, e4. You know, I can do e4. But, I mean, I'm giving scope to your bishop, giving it hope, you know, and a reason to live. I mean, it's a controversial move, so I decided I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm okay with having no space. I love having no space. My problem is my knight. What am I going to do with my knight? You know, maybe, honestly, you know, maybe I could play knight b8, knight a6, knight c7. It's not, not a great solution either. But let's see. The b8, the f8 square is the other square you can go to. So my plan was here. <clears throat> also, to push for b5. And now you played rook f3, and this was a tremendous move. Although it looked weird at the time, it gives him rook lifts, it gives him doubling up, it's part of like a general kingside attack based on like h4, g5. And he gets the rook off the diagonal with the bishop on, on, uh, on a6. You know, here I decided to run for the hills, but maybe it wasn't necessary. What am I supposed to play though? Like knight b8? Oh, that's great, you know. I'm going right into this kingside attack. I can try to run over and and grab your pawn like you from Geller. Like you're Geller. I'm I'm like Capablanca or Bafnik or whoever Geller beat in the in the same Mishnimzo. Uh, it was um you know Zurich 1953. Geller had some really good same Stimzo where black grabs the pawn on c4. I can't remember who Geller was playing. Alright. I don't think it was Geller Kavablanka. Um, Alright. Now I have no space, so you've got a really good attack now. Bishop h4, king e7. This is great. Rook g3. Now my g7's weak here. I'm just clearly worse here, by the way. He covers a4 and introduces the threat of bishop h5. White's better by like a pawn now. And now I played knight b8, and this has got to be a mistake, right? What if I put the knight on f8? 
Not great either, but at least it supports like G6. I think Knight F8 has got to be better than Knight B8. I have no future there. And at this point, I was looking at, I was starting to freak out the of sacrifices. We have 10 viewers and your cat's not even included, Percy Hepworth. <clears throat> Hold on a second, guys. My neighbors are getting rambunctious. Let's try to set the record for, for Thursday night serious stream viewers. Um, here I was inconsistent, but I, I, I really I wanted to stay on this diagonal. And uh, I was getting low on time. But I was afraid of sacrifices. This F6 is very weak. So we're starting to look at possible bishop takes f6 type of stuff. I mean, all he really needs is say, like, queen d2. If you add in queen d2, I think we start to see real sacrifices. There's there's the dark squares are starting to break down. This here is getting overloaded. Hello, can I get rid of that, please? All right, overloaded. We get one, two, really three against two. You can overload me on the dark square. So that's why I played this horrible move, queen f8, but this is a disaster. White is clearly, clearly almost winning here. Now queen g4. <laughs> and at this point, um, I don't understand why I didn't at least consider why didn't I at least consider taking the, the pawn at c4? Does white have an actual threat in this position? I mean, is this a threat? It's not a threat. I should take this pawn at c4. I have to. So now king d7. I missed the chance to take the pawn. Queen e2. You realized your mistake. King c7. A4, stopping any kind of B5, so now I have no counterplay at all. And then I basically made a waiting move, queen E7, and now A5. This is very aggressive, but it's probably good. I think that I, I don't want to risk taking. And now the last hope was to come here, but you're getting on the A file. Maybe you shouldn't exchange. You know, um, but I guess I'm also threatening b5. Okay, so here, takes, check, here, rook a1. And now, the question is, like, maybe black can survive. I mean, it's a terrible, horrible, passive position for black, but... I'm not certain that black is definitely lost. But I think, like, you know, eventually, if you keep the pressure, you can eventually manage to play, like, h4 and g5. Sooner or later, you'll engineer this break with h4 and g5. While simultaneously keeping threats on the queen side, along the b and... You know, obviously, also the, the a, a and b files, so... You can engineer moving this rook over, you know, somehow, back over here laterally, and then your queen over. You can basically threaten to attack me on both sides of the board. <clears throat> so at this point, I just freaked out, basically, due to the fact that I had no space. I, I blundered bishop f7, and then I'm lost. I mean, once I allow bishop f7, it's just totally lost. This is too invasive. I mean, I'm lost now. It was just a total oversight. Not even, in, you know, it's the material is important, but the space, he's got, he's overwhelming me. I mean, not even just winning this g7 pawn it would, would destroy me as well, but. So I give up the exchange here, here. 
I'm not even sure if you should take the exchange objectively. You know, maybe you should put your bishop on e6. It's worth more than, you know, this is clearly worth more than a rook. Probably you shouldn't even take the exchange. I don't know what you guys watching think about it, but you know, it's a practical game, and we're both getting low on time. So he took the exchange. I took, and I plays queen h5, and that's really bad because I'm losing another pawn. And then this was, well, no way to defend, um, there's no way to defend g7. So I'm losing a pawn. Takes, 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 takes. So now I'm down the exchange and a pawn. But white has only one pass pawn on the h file. Um... It's too much, though, you know. I mean, there's no no way I can save the position. I should be able to save the position. Bishop takes c4 here, here, here. You're winning, trading pieces. And now the sending should be a fairly easy win. I've got to defend the base of my pawn chain, but you threaten to penetrate with rook a7 check. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't save me. Plus, you have rook a6. I mean, there's no way I can save this pawn. So you're winning with the h pawn, and you're winning the base of my pawn chain at d6. So my only chance is the pass pawn takes, takes, here, push, and now off to the races on the king's side. h4, bishop d3. You know, ideally, like you would want to push both of these pawns up. But you have to watch out now because b2 is a threat. This isn't really as much about taking the e4 pawn as I'm threatening b2. So you found bishop a3, and I didn't take, I didn't take on e4, but I don't know why. And now bishop b2, knight e4, here, knight d6, e4, now I have two pass pawns, and I'm going to surround the other one, but you still have two connected pass pawns on the king side, so you're still winning, rook g3. I don't know about that. I wonder if you were to lose the exchange, would it be a draw? Let's take a look at the engine here. So let's just say you played like king f2, I played knight c4, and you played g4. You can't hang a piece, okay. I played knight c4, you play like bishop d4. You're still winning here. If knight e3, king e3, my point is that these two connected pass pawns are winning. Even ops color, even ops color bishop situation. You just need to keep those two, two connectors. Rook g3 goes in front of your pawn, which is a little bit awkward. Here, knight c4. Here. Take, take. And so you're still winning. Because the two connected pass pawns are so strong. Obviously, if my king was in the center, maybe I would be able to save the game. You're still winning h5 here, h6, and then e3, and now rook f3. You hesitated. You win a piece with h7. I mean, obviously, I can sack. Check. King b6. Rook takes h7, and now I'm, I'm not going to be able to save the game. Because if king c5, king f1, king d5, king e2, and you win. <coughs> yeah, it's still winning all the way. So rook f3 was your, your big mistake. Giving me time. And I blundered. I should have played king b6. Maybe you're still winning here. Let's see. Rook f3, king c7, g4. No, this was your biggest mistake. g4. Which is very natural, by the way. Apparently it's a draw now. My king gets in the game. Now maybe it's a draw. Okay. So g6. And you had a draw up till the end, too. Only now I missed... Um, I missed e2, right? At some point, I had e2. 
Knight f3 check followed by e2. Right, so here I had e2 check. And then I'll checkmate you with bishop and knight, hopefully. Now it's a draw. Bishop h7, rook h5, king here. Now all you need to do is play king e2, and it's a draw. But he found a way to lose. King e2, bishop e4, and then rook takes g5. And it's still a draw. Rook takes g5, bishop f3 check, and you just need to go to d3, stay in contact with the pawn on e3. But he wanted to lose, so he played king e1, and after king g5, I won the game. Of course. Easy win. Easy win, denying, denying a deserved victory from Schumacher. And that's why he's 1900. All right, Morales, Morales submitted a game. Sorry, guys, that was a really long game. Schumacher specializes in, in submitting, like, really long games against me. And then he knows it's going to be super long, because I analyze my own games even longer than the normal ones. <clears throat> um, all right, I've got Acerbate. Astrobeat is up next. This is not the right game. All right, analysis. Guys, don't forget to donate. Support the stream. Don't forget. We don't really have $90 in uh, donations because Nils didn't really donate. It's a less than payment. Neil Skinner, thanks for subscribing with Prime. We're really at $30 for the Christmas fund. Um, Nils, Nils uh, used the donation command to, uh, to pay me for lessons. So our actual, our actual donation bar is at $30, not 90 Disclaimer. Nils trying to pretend that lesson donations, uh, lesson payments are donations. All right, not the first person to do this. Um, <clears throat> all right, study here, acerbate. This is the correct game. All right, guys, what's up? King Kong. Feel free to donate some subs to the, some subs to the stream. I'm only taking games that are submitted by subscribers. You have to be a subscriber of the stream in order to do analysis game. And anyways, are we are we on the right page now? We are on the right page. This is Acerbate. I haven't seen this one. Computer lies. You know, Acerbate, you are the reason why there's a fast forward button, aren't you? I was telling you guys for like a few months now I've been complaining about the the VCR style playback feature of the game saying there's really no reason why the fast forward button should exist. Acerbate is the only reason why the fast forward button should exist. Fast forward to the end button, which is like the most annoying feature on Lee Chess. So I hit this accidentally all the time and I'm just like, "Oh, who wants to go to the end of the game?" But in Astrobate's case, you know, the really cool mate is is all that matters. What's up? Neil Skinner, welcome. Thank you for subscribing. So I've got a game from Astrobate, a game from Neil Skinner, a game from Morales. VIP Astrobate, VIP Morales. We're else closing in on 500 games, aren't you? Can I see Morales' account? No. Okay. Have we hit 500 games? Not yet, right? So, Astrobate versus the Cat King of Charleston. Charles. Charleston. How do you spell Charleston? Charleston, South Carolina.
Um, blood sacrifice. Very. Um, yeah, Mule Skinner maybe should be considered for VIP status. I think. In in you know in in the kick stream you would be OG. You definitely get OG status, but um, there is no OG status here. We have VIP. Okay, you will be considered for VIP status, status or status. Um, three hundred games should should probably be seriously a VIP. The mule skinner kind of started to fall fall back. GG or O O M G. So this is Aspate. Where's Charles? How do you spell Charleston? Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina. Isn't it spelled differently? Okay, Aspate with knight f three, d five, e three, queen's queen's Indian attack. Quid. Qu 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 quia. The vicious e three. I don't know if I've seen you do this before. The quid attack. Here's the problem. I played this game with uh Yeah. A long time ago. It was like nineteen ninety nine. I hate Bishop G four. No no, Bishop G four is not that bad. You have C four. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. It's better against uh against this. Bishop G four is better here. Okay, so against against E3 it's not so clear that bishop g4 is is that big a deal because you have c4. Hmm. H3 bishop f3. H3 h3 bishop f3. H3 bishop h5. B3. Who would play b3? Mario Mancini apparently. I see, so the idea is actually h3, oh no, it's Glenn Fleer, h3, bishop h5, and then c4. We kick him off the diagonal, and then we open the center. Very nice. Okay, anyway, Aspirate, I just wanted to take a look at that. Bishop g4 is a possibility. Um, knight f6, and then b3. So now we've got a game from the Cuban Grandmaster Reynaldo Vera, the only game where this position has arisen. Knight on bd7, it's an unusual move, but how bad can it be? I mean, black could follow up with standard kind of stuff. e6, c6, obviously b5 is not an option, g6. How bad can knight on bd7 be? Bishop b2. I mean, one point of it is you can play g6 and the f6 knight protects the other knight. Obviously. But you have c4 now. That gives white some advantage, I think. Maybe you have to play like e6. How bad is this? So this is actually playable for black. It's not that bad. We saw a similar game a while back against uh, someone that Acerbate played, where he did something crazy like h4, h5. Don't do h4, h5. Please. So your opponent played e6. Now c4, best move. You know, now we've got a very standard kind of blacks playing the Kali, Kali system with reverse colors. So check this out. 67 games here were black, you know, to move. And not one of them played D takes C4. I don't like the move. I don't like this move in principle for black. Obviously black is giving up the strong point on D5 for no really good reason. Zeus. Zeus, 
Where is everybody? We have eight viewers. Nobody wants to, like, take chess seriously. I don't understand. You don't want to learn. It's fine. I told... Actually, I told the viewers in the beginning of the stream. If you're an idiot, just, like, don't watch. And now we only have eight viewers, so... Um... I think that everyone left when I told the idiots to leave the room. But, um... I'm just thinking about this a little bit. You know, it's it's a, it's possible black can play like a6, b5, c5, try to play bishop b7 in a kind of queen's gambit accepted style. I don't think that d takes c4 is that horrible. But it's also like straight up bishop takes c4 with tempo. You know, we're not even like moving our bishop. At least black should wait until white moves this bishop to like e2. Say you play bishop e6, white plays bishop e2. Now this would be less of a waste of time if you chose, if you want to play that for some reason. I still don't like it, but at least white is, if he wants to take with the bishop, he's going to have to move it twice. Nothing will change anyway. Now if I leave, I'm an idiot. If you leave and you don't watch my stream, obviously you're an idiot. Unless you have a unless you have a good excuse. Even the babies like watching my stream. So alright. D takes C4. Grand Grandmasters anonymously watch my stream. They're just ashamed to admit it in most cases. Um So D takes C4. Most Grandmasters are not, you know, not they're too shy to admit they watch my stream. Bishop takes c4. You know, seriously, Aspid, I mean, this is a move too, but since you're getting it for free, I would take with the bishop. Um, and now black played a6, and I do think that's... Um, this chick is like 2440 now. She's like Nevenici's girlfriend. Um, a6... Makes sense. I mean, this is the only shot really Black has to go for, to go for. Uh, I think she's from Moldova, probably Moldo Moldovia, Moldova, but plays for Romania. Maybe first woman player in Romania, Bulmaga. Um, a six makes the most sense to me. That's what your opponent played as well. Now you played a three. Asturbate, you've been following the hedgehog. My hedgehog advice. Now, this is a nice diagonal for a QGA. But what are white's options here? I mean, if black plays b5, he can strike back. So Margarita just played castles, which is fine. I think it's probably the best move. It's obviously possible to play d4, but it's not necessary, and it's not the most flexible. But as for me, your, your move a3 is, is, is passive. I think, you know, you don't know what you're doing because you're playing a queen pawn game. It's not terrible, but it's, it's like I think you should keep a4 in reserve. So if you castle, black plays b5, and you play bishop e2, the point is you can smack black with a4 at some point on the queen side. And, I mean, this is the move that will probably put the most pressure on, on the opponent's position. Either the, you force them to, like, overextend their pawn, or they trade off their, their powerful pawn on b5, or they let you, you know win the b5 pawn or play a move like c6 which weakens their position so i think that's the point um you played a3 and now your opponent plays b5 and you know now a4 will cost you a move so you, you don't really have that option uh -uh. for the last time no let's try again no can we try one more time? No! This is not really where your bishop is best placed. 
You're walking directly into knight c5. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Like, seriously, what are you going to play if black plays knight c5 here? Well, you're going to move your bishop, and then you're going to go knight d3 check, and now you're not going to have that bishop anymore, or you're going to lose your other bishop. So it's like bishop takes d3, queen d3, and now black is probably better. Major problem. You have to go to e2 here. <clears throat> so that was because Astrid's obsessed with putting his bishop on d3. That's why the pieces belong behind the pawns, where they're sheltered from the enemy attack. Like I was saying earlier, you need a reason not to play the safe move, essentially. You need a reason. You need a reason not to fold Astrobate here. Do you have a reason not to fold? Astrobate is not folding with bishop d3. He's making the call. So strategically losing light square bishop would be bad. First of all, bishops are worth more than knights. Even, you know, most chess players realize that, obviously. Secondly, particularly this position, the light square bishop, you know, yeah, these squares are very weak. So the predominant, like, central pawns of whites are, are on dark squares. We have a much more obvious weakness on the white squares. So absolutely, like the what losing the white square is is a much more problematic than losing our dark square bishop. I really don't want to lose either of them. I mean, this is a pretty open position here we're talking about. It's not like a closed position where all of our pawns were on dark squares or something. Yeah, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. Black plays bishop b7. Now here, and I yeah you know, he has it again. Now bishop b7, and now rook c1, he has it a third time. And then after c5, Astrobate executes this obsess obsessive plan. And I mean, black blocked his own knight c5 anyway. But I mean, all of this just to get this, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, plan implemented with, with rook c1, bishop d3, bishop, bishop b1. Because he's playing for, like, sneaky mates on the long diagonal. Acerbate knows not to do this, I told him. So now castles and... I mean, given the situation here, the fact that your knight will probably roll over to the king's side, I mean, this is going to have to get out of the way to make way for your rook, to make way for the bishop anyway. Um, in order to do that, you probably, you know, you're not going to have to worry about bishop takes f3. I mean, I still think this is probably the correct move for white, but h4 is, is probably justified here. This looks totally insane, but I've played, you know, I've played similarly in the past. I don't think this is totally insane. It just looks totally insane. I mean, maybe it's somewhat justified. Black cannot give up this bishop, really. Or shouldn't, let's say. You know, even if you play, like, rook c8, 92, I wouldn't trade here. This this is too... Too much stuff around the black king here. Very dangerous. You know, not to mention knight f4. So you played h4... And you have the obvious plan of knight g5, in addition to knight e2, knight f4. But knight d5 is like seriously lacking sense of danger. I mean, all of White's pieces are kind of closing in on the black king side from a distance here. And uh, and then the guy like pulls his knight off of f6. I mean, this is the only piece that's defending h7. So I guess the question is like, what should black play? I mean, rook e8, for example, knight g5. Now f7 is weak as well. Should black play h6? If black were to play h6, you could still play knight g5. 
That's how scary the position is for black. I mean, this pawn is like... I mean, you can't take this this piece. It's just too dangerous. No, so h6 has no purpose. I think that black... Yeah, I mean, I would look at rook e8. And I would look at... To free up this... This square as a defensive possibility. And knight g5 is nice, but still you're not winning. You know, he can defend. He can defend his king side. And then there's like the sort of standard robotic move. Let's say rook, rook c8, rook c7, queen a8. I don't know. But this is weird. Okay, knight d5 doesn't help black, really. I mean, I guess he's trying to play bishop f6, but you can play knight e4. I mean, incidentally, you want to do this anyway to get out of the way of your bishop and rook. And if black plays f5, you know, he's done. Or almost done. I mean, based on e6. This looks... I mean, honestly, like, this almost looks like I can sack the house with knight g5 to open up the queen here. It's pretty over the top, though. I mean, this isn't quite sound, it looks like. So let's do this. And now black's only way to protect this pawn. Knight c7 or queen b6. Which would both like draw pieces away from the king side. I think now we're looking at possible knight takes h7. Just, just you know, for kicks and giggles. Like we could say maybe queen b6, knight takes h7. Is black going to survive here? Maybe. Takes, check, king g8, queen h5. I mean, I don't think black's surviving. Oh, he has two knights. He is, he is. He has two knights. Okay, he has two knights. He has two knights to defend h7. But anyway, it's like very, um, very, very dangerous for black. You played queen c2. Which is a massive cheapo. I mean, I think your queen already has great potential. Ironically, he had the same thing happened in another game where he went the wrong way. He should have played queen c2, and he like played for queen h5. Now g6. I mean, I say I think you see some limitation of the queen and bishop here. G6 solves that, but now this diagonal is weak. So h5. Yeah, I'd say white is nearly winning. White is probably winning here. Strategically speaking, white is winning. Because you have like one, two, three, really four, five, six, really six pieces that can directly join the attack. The only white pieces, these two pieces, I said six pieces, five pieces. Well, this sort of in the game, okay. Really just the rook at c1 that's not... Really, the rook at c1 is the only piece that's not in the white attack here. You can, you know, move your king up and then scoop it, scoot it over to, uh, scoop it, scoot it over to h1 to follow up. Now hg6, and now black played fg6. But actually, I mean, there's probably no, no way to save the position for black anyway. So fg6, I mean, if he does hg6, it's like, okay, the h file looks insane. So here, now this is weak, plus you have sacks here and here. Knight e5, directly threatening knight takes g6, and then knight takes c3, and now there's the control of e4. So I think that we should, we should uh, remain calm it's tempting to do like knight takes g6. But I'm afraid it's not a good idea because of bishop e4. It wouldn't be enough. You know, it's not necessary. So you should do queen takes. I don't know which way to recapture on c3. What about rook h7? No. I mean, this almost works. It's just this one move, you know, that's really the problem. 
I don't think this is gonna fly, so I mean it's it's close. Same thing with knight g6, bishop e4. I mean maybe I don't know, take, check, queen takes, queen takes c3, bishop takes b1. We're winning anyway, right? We are winning here. This is winning. I mean this bishop is, is devastating. And black's king is completely open. It's winning. Knight takes c3, bishop takes c3, now he has bishop e4. What else can black do? Not 94. Let's see what the computer says. Wow, 94 holds. <sighs> Unbelievable that black's actually okay here. Was knight g6 seriously the move for you? Oh, queen takes c3. So it was queen takes c3. You know, you could be attacked here as well. You didn't play this, obviously, because your queen gets attacked by knight d5, and you'll have to move again. But then you just renew everything. I mean, it doesn't really matter. You know, you're going to eventually get the sack in on g6. He has queen e8. This is still horrible for black. I mean, not to mention threats like knight d5, queen c2, queen e8, knight g4, threatening knight h6 mate. I mean, this is like, how, do, how does black not get mated in this position? You know, it's pretty hard not to get mated here. Rook takes h7 looks kind of nasty too. I, I don't want to know about that. Takes, takes, takes. Some problems, some technical problems, <coughs> maybe. So good game, Masturbate, but you should have taken with the queen at c3. This is really insanely materialistic by black. No way I would play that move unless you paid me. I mean, clearly, like, knight e4 would block the diagonal. And also threaten f2, and also threaten to eliminate one of the attacking pieces at c3. And I thought maybe bishop e4 is worth... Bishop e4 has to be worth considering. Can we sack a queen? Well, this would be a little speculative. You know, I don't think we're going to be sacking our queen here. It's close. But I think you have to move your queen or play d3. So that was a mistake. This was greedy, and now rook h7. Wow. There's one problem. He misses bishop e4. So... Wow. So you missed bishop e4. And... I mean, king takes is, is mate. Knight takes is mate. So this is like the only move. I mean, I guess he could play knight e4. Theoretically. But this is more forcing, like bishop e4 is more forcing. So he plays this, this is losing. Okay, what's the engine say? He's still alive after either knight e4 or bishop e4. Wow, knight e4 is actually the best move. It's unbelievable that black is okay here. I mean, it's a spectacular sacrifice, man. I, I, I think you're, you should be proud of the game in general. But this, is, this has got instinct. This is not calculated. Not a well-calculated sacrifice. It's, it's an instinctive sacrifice. Your opponent is the only player I've ever seen who played faster than you. Rook h7 is nice, but it's got a big fat hole in it, you know? I'm being attacked by fruit flies. Please donate. Um, but anyway, let's see the end. So takes, check here, and then that is a really beautiful idea now. I mean, I wanted this to work, you know, that's the problem. It's not mate though. So he's got it the other way. Huh. Where is the mate?
you're winning every different possible way. I mean, obviously, if you play Queen to HG2, black is toast. There's no way he's going to survive this. But after Knight F7, he has to take... And it's still mate. Steel mate. But not right away. So if Queen H6 check... He, he can play king g8 and survive. That's the point. So you have to actually take the time to take the rook. Now there's no way to block this diagonal. And, I mean, queen g8, I guess. That would be funny. But there's no immediate... Mate, we have to... Made in a few. After queen g8. Black played this, uh, don't think that's going to work. Nice one. Queen h7. All right. Has to be entertaining game. Entertaining game. All right. Mule Skinner. Mule Skinner and Morales. I also have my game, you know. We can use that. I have my game from the World Senior. One of my games from the World Senior I can show every week if people don't get too bored. Um, now, Mule Skinner, I have to search in the, the mailbag. Mailbag. A funny game I played, a funny game I played this Sunday, last Sunday, 90 plus 30 OTB. Oh, you're back in, you're back in Spain. Granada. Manana. Copy. Alright, tools analysis board. Tools analysis board. Where the hell is my study? Add a new chapter. This better work. Ironically, it's Mule Skinner versus Antonio. Did Morales leave? You guys have to be subscribers to submit a game. Why am I bringing this game up? Alright. Sun Prism. Only subscribers can, can submit games. You can also beg for gift subs. I don't recommend begging for gift subs. If there's not enough games submitted by subscribers, I mean, I've been away for two weeks, so things have been a little slow around here. Acerbate C, Acerbate did it. Hmm, weird smell. I smell, I smell like raw raw steak or something. Is that like a sign I haven't had enough iron in my my diet or something? You start just randomly smelling raw steak in your in your office. I mean, is that, is that like a something telling my body, telling me something? Like, I haven't had enough, like, I haven't had enough, like, um, enough blood in my diet or what? Uh, all right, here. Um, Mule Skinner. I need more ribeyes. Tell me about it, man. Oh. It's too expensive. All right, Mule Skinner, Antonio. Ironically, Morales is Antonio, so it's kind of funny. It's like two of our longtime subscribers playing each other. No, it's actually a random guy named Antonio playing black here against Mule Skinner. This is an OTB game. Okay, it's not a French defense. For like the first time in two years, I think Mule Skinner submitted a game that's not a French defense. Unbelievable. Um, I. I have to say, you know, Mule Skinner, since you started watching my stream, whatever, five years ago, I found your your play to be really, really strong in closed positions and, and weaker in open positions. And that's kind of a massive generalization, but, you know, that's all I could come up with in short notice. When I played against you, I used the Cairo Khan and Scandinavian a lot because I felt like most of your repertoire hinges on close setups, you know, and you're playing the, the Panov against the Karo Khan 
is kind of inconsistent with the rest of the repertoire. Grand Prix attack, closed King Pong games. But I felt like this pan off was the one place where I could get you in a kind of open position, you know? So I'm not saying it's 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 great, I like the pan off, but I've always thought you had a kind of inconsistent repertoire in that sense. There's really very little similarity between the Grand Prix attack and the pan of Karo Khan. But anyway, maybe it's good for you to play something where you... I'm not saying it's bad for you, but it's just... I've always noticed that. So this is the first time we've seen you submit like a game in the Karo Khan. D4, D5 takes, takes... You know, the, the stupid exchange variation has seen a lot of uh, popularity. I hate it, you know? I mean, Magnus has really made chess boring, more boring than it was before he came along, I think, um, to be honest. Because the guy plays a lot of really uninteresting openings where he just grinds people down. And he's the most influential chess player in the world. <coughs> um, not, not exciting in the way that, like, Fischer Kasparov was exciting as a world champion. Magnus is 2800 because of the way he like wins drawn positions against people and stuff. But this bishop d3 is insipid. You know, I hate that. Okay, so c4, e6. e6 is an unusual move order by black, by the way. It's like, that's already like a little bit strange. I would actually take something away from that. My opponent, you know, playing e6 makes you wonder, does this guy know what he's doing? You know, nobody plays e6 there. It's very, very rare. There's basically no reason to play e6. You know, I mean, you normally play knight f6 and you wait and see. Maybe you'll play e6 on the next move or not. It's kind of funny. Um, you can see the, the distribution in the, in the opening explorer. I mean, my biggest problem is getting overconfident. So if somebody played e6 against me, I'm probably going to be, like, already getting a little bit overconfident. But you can see there's a reason why only 2% of games feature E6. It's just unnecessary. It would be a positive thing, I think, you know, for for you to be like, okay, this guy doesn't really know what he's doing. Knight C3, Knight F6, and now Knight F3. And um, I am not believing in, uh, I'm not believing in c5 here. There's a bunch of games in the opening explorer with c5. I assume it's something that's like plausible, but really, is bishop g5 bad? No, I mean, bishop g5 is some kind of, I think I might have faced bishop g5 once actually. Um, it's less common. I mean, it's not a queen's gambit. It's more open than a queen's gambit. So white has to be careful about getting the king side developed with the fact that, I mean, his king is in the center. If you put the c pawn back on c7 and the pawn back on e2, it's a more closed position. So I think white can get away with this queen side move, bishop g5, you know, a lot more easily than he can here, move 11. I'm not saying like bishop g5 is refuted or refutable or it's concretely bad, but there's definitely a reason why it's infrequently played. Black would probably play h6, drive the bishop to the short the short bus diagonal. I've definitely tried some crazy stuff like queen a5. Um, I've also probably had a similar game once where something really crazy happened like bishop g5, queen a5, bishop d2, I mean something along those lines. But I think that was with the knight on c6, that was a different position. I lost the game once. It was like knight f6, knight c3, where I was black and my opponent played bishop but this is a much more, this is a much more well-known variation. Yeah, I guess I played queen a5 and he played bishop d2. I didn't know this is like even like I didn't know this was even like a variation for white. 
Um, okay, but against e6, black's, black's developing his king side, you know, more quickly, like in a Nimzo. So, the other possibility, obviously, is c takes d5. You, you can play c takes d5. I mean, there's nothing really wrong with that. I will confess something, though. You know, most people playing black will, will go against the IQP, trying to blockade the IQP with knight d5. But I've had a number of games with Vadaj Laszlo, Braden Borneval, maybe other people online where they took with the e pawn, and I just kind of felt sick when they do this. I guess this transposes to some kind of. I don't know, it's almost like a French now. I always hated this for some reason. Jonathan Spielman, Valdez, Valdez Laszlo, and Raiden Bourneval. But I mean, I think it's C5. I was just looking at the statistics there. It's kind of dubious. The question is can Black play B6 right away? Bartel versus Dreyev, 2004. B4. So I think that Black would normally play Bishop E7 first. If I go back to my Alexei Swayton, Karo Khan for the tournament player, circa 1986, I think this is a variation now, you know. But essentially... I'm curious about this exact moment. Is b6 a good move? Engine engine analysis confirmed. Funny that knight c6 has a good score because I don't think it's a great move. Bishop b7 should be played first and then... Yeah, so that's a weird sideline. Actually, something a mule skinner might like because it, it leads to closed positions. Um, it would be a sideline. Swedish variation reversed. So, okay, your opponent plays e6, we play this, boom, boom, knight f3, bishop e7. Now it's, now c5 is a thing. Like, it's, it's an old school variation, probably. This is definitely in Karo Khan for the tournament player. First edition, you know, 1983 or whatever. Very standard situation. I mean, c5, b6, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's an old school way of playing. So Mule Skinner plays c takes d5. Which is fine. You know, and most people are going to take with a knight. But it's also possible to take with a pawn. He takes with a knight. Okay, now we have an absolutely classic, you know, Panov, Karo Khan, isolated pawn position. And this can also be reached by the semi-tarash. I guess it, it really is a semi-tarash, just as much as it is a Karakhan now. So bishop d3, and now black normally would play castles or knight c6. I had this game, I had a game like back in... September against some guy who played the semi tarsh against me. It was this line, in fact. He played knight c6. I played castles, and then he did like bishop f6 right away. I didn't know what. I was like, what is that? This is the game where I played bishop e4. I offered a draw, and the guy like declined my draw by hanging a pawn here. Did anybody remember that? Wasn't it this position? Am I misremembering? He had castled or something? Yeah, yeah, it was rookie one, castles, bishop e4, and he hung a pawn with b6. This is the position, okay, it was semi-tarash. So you had bishop d3, which is also possible to play bishop c4. Actually, Bill Skinner, I have a book right here. Um, Dynamic Chess Strategy by Suba. I keep it on my desk. One of the most disorganized people that I've ever read. Um... But Suba likes bishop c4. It's interesting. It's it's definitely not great to play bishop b5 check. That's another move. But, you know, you, this is too passive. It's just a question of d3 or c4. But c4 is interesting. It's an interesting alternative. Because the knight, you know, can't hit it. It hits it with b4 sometimes. 
It also keeps your, your D4 pawn protected. What does the computer prefer? Uh, it prefers bishop d3. This is a more natural square for the bishop. So black now plays h6. Wow. Zero games with h6. Acerbait. This looks like a move you would like. How bad can h6 really be? Um, I'm seeing like queen e4 in my future. Let's just say Suba talks about these lines and he had a game where he features his win against my old you know grandmaster draw partner Farago Ivan Rip who died like last year. He beat Farago in a in a main line type position where black didn't play h6 obviously and played like g6. But h6, unlike g6, weakens different squares. Whereas g6 weakens the dark squares. Here we're weakening the light squares. So I think this is going to be a real issue. But I mean, I think that black can probably defend. You know, I mean, you can bring the knight back. Oftentimes black brings the knight back anyway to f6. And h6 concretely takes away g5. You will not have knight g5 or bishop g5. There are possible bishop sacrifices on h6. That could be a, a really big issue, too. It has to be bad. No, I agree. I mean, you know, how bad is the question? Is it like losing? You know, it's not as bad as b6, maybe. Let's see. b6 is 0. 0.9. Let's take a look at h6. See? So it's funny, isn't it? Like, just, just the point to make a point of reference. Look at this position h6 is negative 0.7 whereas b6 a move that's actually been played by as you can see this has been played by by 22 master level players this move is literally as bad or worse than h6 he plays both um, he plays both in the game okay well I mean yeah b6 is a standard idea Obviously, neither is ideal. We don't want to make pawn moves if we don't have to. I agree with you. H6, castles, castles, rookie one. Indian uh, I am played uh, A3 here. It's a standard move against Subaraman, who's a uh, women GM. Subaraman. But... Um, she was like the pre, pre uh, humpy number one Indian women's player. Castles a3, setting up, you know, the classic sort of bishop c2, queen d3. But, you know, maybe white doesn't need to waste their time with that. I would, I would suggest queen e2, played by some pretty good players here. The only problem is, like, I'm not sure if we're really threatening to play queen e4 or not. I mean, obviously, like, b6, queen e4 looks pretty ugly. Black has to play f5. He's in a bad way. So, uh, Dolmatov had this position against Sveshnikov in 1982. And Pia got it against some 2200. Wow. So, Sveshnikov unable to beat Dolmatov... And Domata was at his peak normally there, um, 1982, 97. This is just not incisive. You know, you don't want to do that. Okay, castles here. You played what? Rookie one. And now black. Yeah, black's played h6. I mean, it's not easy. To suggest, you know, probably Domatov style move here um, would be best. Knight c6 is standard, I guess. So, wow, look how many games we transpose to. People are actually playing that h6 move just a little bit later. I mean, it's still bad for black. It's still bad. 
You know, you're not seeing any big names here with the black pieces, obviously. Good counter contest. Karpov ain't playing h6, you know, I mean. Unless he has to. Or there's a really good reason to do it. But okay, b6, b6 is logical. But how many pawn moves can we afford to make? This is really similar to a to a position in uh wow, this is really similar to a position in this other book I have, Questions of Modern Chess Theory by Lipnitsky. Very, very similar. It's like a puzzle position. White to move and, and gain like a clear advantage or something. Knight takes d5, pawn takes d5, and then what? You know, you have um What's the best move for white? It's it's very, very similar. It's incredible. Knight takes d5, pawn d5. I think like the bishop's on d6 though in in the Lipnitsky position. I'm pretty sure this piece is actually on that square. It's a Petrov. Virtually the same exact position. In the Nitsky's example, and the puzzle is for white, you know, what's the best way for white to continue? Most people say knight e5. Here we have a different situation because the bishop's on e7, which is good and bad for black. Bishop is more passively placed. d5 is protected. Um, bishop's also vulnerable along the e-file. But I mean, this Mr. Coffee, where you been all my life? This position, dude. Ninety-five is obviously the most, the most obvious. Obviously, the most obvious. It's the obvious move. But I think we should look for more. We should look for other options. Are there any other options, though? Queen e two doesn't do anything. You know, clearly this is a good move, Mule Skinner. I mean, you know much, I, I hate the London system. But, um, you see, that's the problem with the, with the Lipnitsky position. That it's not an option. I, I mean, these, it's funny that I have things that are cropping up in the books on my table, like right now. Really funny. That's why you should study chess. Don't listen to bloggers who say you shouldn't buy chess books. If that bishop's on d6, it's a Petrov, and we don't have bishop f4. Now you have bishop f4. I mean, bishop f4 is developing move. One possibility move 11 used the other day in a in a Petrov exchange French. Um, you, you have queen d2, bishop takes h6, resigns. I mean, there's something to be said for development, right? This is an issue, though. You're avoiding bishop g4. And maybe you're right. This, this, you know, I'm talking about move 11's game. He had something like h3, by the way. So maybe we need h3 in order to play bishop f4 and avert bishop g4. It feels like black's real close to, like, being tactically lost somehow here, though. This is unprotected. This is vulnerable. That's unprotected. I mean... No, I just don't see it, though. Okay, you can play h3, and you're clearly better after this. But it's not over. You know, black's going to survive. We, do, we don't really want to allow trades of pieces. Okay, so knight e5. And now you have this. Oof, that's actually really strong. Queen h5 is... You have queen h5, you have the standard um, rook lift with rook e3. Plus just building pressure with bishop f4. So now, yeah, black's in deep shit. I mean, he can't even play knight d7 because that loses immediately. So, bishop e6. I mean, you know, now we're looking at knight g6. So he plays that. And I'm a happy camper. This is really over. So the problem is, this gives up any kind of defensive... Black just loses any kind of defensive ability on that diagonal. Yeah. So now you sector bishop, wow. 
Yeah, it always brings back memories of the time I lost to now rated 2080. Quote unquote, Grandmaster Rasat Ziatnov. Apparently, the guy's really insane. Um, he did a Bishop takes H6 against me in the Karo Khan. This is really obvious. I would have played Queen H5, but, you know, maybe my move is just more, you know, it's, it's more um, overt and actually would give him a chance to try to defend with something like Bishop G5. Too overt. Knight F7, do you have this? It's just a nice shot. Knight f7. Knight f7, rook f7, bishop g5. Queen g5, and then rook e8 check, and you, you win. Do you win? Rook f8, do you win? Do you, in fact, win? actually not so convinced yeah bishop check at the end I don't think that's decisive first of all our queen's hanging we're giving away too many pieces this is a draw at least for black and this is unclear as well. I mean, it doesn't look like black's lost here. Black's actually better. No, we give away too many pieces in that line. Okay. It's cute and it's close, but I mean, he could try to survive with bishop g5. Obviously, you have f4. You have a huge advantage. You're probably winning. Um, or other moves. Wait, do we have something better knight f7? Maybe we have this, right? We have queen g6. I just need to, like, see... Yeah, when the smoke clears, I'll be all right. No, we're winning, we're winning. We're mating black here. I'm just not primitive enough to do this kind of stuff, you know. My primitive instincts have been, have been, uh, really toned down by, by civilized, civilized life. I'm just not base and primitive enough to find these kind of brutal mates. But Bishop H6 looks good. The problem is, okay, like I beat, uh, I once beat, with black, I once beat this a strong FM, Boris, Boris uh, Basinski, because I just, like, didn't take, you know. He obviously shouldn't take, and you know, take is suicide. But let's just make sure, you know, we understand it. So if, if he takes, what's your intention, like, queen g4 check? That's kind of strong. So you play queen g4 check, he has to play bishop g5, because anything else is, like, made on h7, essentially. I mean, this doesn't look healthy. Check here. Check. King g5. Needless to say, um, needless to say, this is unhealthy. Check. Come in! Um, nothing to see there, folks. So bishop takes, pawn takes, queen g4 check, bishop g5, and you still have queen f5. And there's no need for anything, you know, fancy here. You're just winning, okay. So he can't take, bishop g5, and then what? Nothing nothing along the lines of bishop g7? Thematic double, double piece sacrifice, or re-sacrifice, or re-sacrificing. Doesn't look clear, does it? He has, um, you know, he'll have rook h8 in some position. So bishop g7, king g7. It's close, though. I mean, I, I guess it might work. Because f7 is so weak, right? We have queen h5. Here, bishop g7 also wins. Okay, but it's complicated, right? No, it looks really strong. It looks really strong. You've got full mobilization. I mean, this guy's pieces just didn't leave the barn, you know? Student body attack. 
So queen takes g5, rook e3. Ah, reinforcements. Ooh. Poor guy just never could develop his queen side. Dude, that's just brutal. Yeah, there's no way black can survive. Maybe this is his best shot. Ugh. What about bishop h7? That's illegal. Okay, other than that, it's good. Um, f4 decoy. Very nice. Very nice. And queen h5. f4 decoy. What? This works? This works? I didn't think it worked. Oh, you win the queen. Oh, that's beautiful. Rook h8. So I'm only looking at queen h5. Beautiful. And winning the queen. Very elegant. Knight takes d5. You're letting his bishop come into the game, man. <laughs> I still want to play for mate here. Uh, I don't know. I like his bad bishop being bad. I wouldn't even take that pawn. Feels like you should go for, you should go for more attacking moves like queen h five. I would probably do queen h five. This is a little materialistic. Knight takes d5, and then black should probably lose anyway. It doesn't matter, it's fine. Is it the best move? You're plus 9. It doesn't really matter, okay. Queen h5 is plus 10, and knight takes d5 is plus 9, so I'm criticizing Mule Skinner. Knight takes d5, you're materialistic, man. It wasn't enough material. He has to take the pawn on d5. And now, yeah, that's the obvious problem there. So good game, open position attack from Mule Skinner, very nice. Okay, the other Antonio. Hmm. Wait. By the way, we had um, a gift sub earlier. Guys, listen, I just wanna kind of um, make a disclaimer that our new, our new um, donation bar is not correct. It's really at $30 because Nils decided to pay for his lesson by making a donation. So we jumped the gun a little bit with 18% of the donation bar being reached. In reality, it's only about 7%. So don't be too excited for me. I know how to blunder in endgames, man. I can show you my own. Morales. Morales is only capable of submitting like blitz games to the stream. You should play in our rapid tournaments more, more often. You're always set you're always sending in like 3-0 games. 3 plus 2. He doesn't have time to play like most people. <clears throat> Sadly, Morales doesn't live the life of a chess professional um, like myself. Who instead of tournament play, I have to like teach lessons all the time. I can never go to tournaments. Um, can links be sent? Links can be sent, um, or simply send me the message on Lee Chess. Send me the game on Lee Chess. That's actually easier. So I'm operating with um, the two computers, and I can't. I have Twitch on the on the other machine, so I can't grab the links from Twitch and put them. You beaten Faruja. You have to be a subscriber, Faruja. So, all right. This is Morales with Black. <clears throat> Chigorin defense. Ugh. All right. I was thinking the other day. Um. How do I get an open game with black, right? D4, D5, Knight F3. I mean, objectively, okay. C5 is the sharpest move for black. Morales playing Knight C6. Now, if you were if you were to move here, you could play E5. Um, all right, I like G3. Your opponent played E3. This is a very passive move against the Chigorin, but he still reserves the right to play C4. It's not that bad. <coughs> Hmm. 
you can you can play. Um, are you play? What are you gonna do? An Albin? No one has played e five here. Okay, it's it's not a it's it's not a good gambit probably. Bishop g four is standard. It's interesting though. Um, bishop f five and um, you know bishop f five is interesting. Bishop f five c four e six. And now you see a three has been played, stopping knight before. But I mean, it's hard to say how black should continue from this point. Let's see. Well, Marchea Parligras lost with white, knight f6. He played knight of bd2. George Meyer played that, and, and Matamoros played that. But knight c3 was played. Okay, this is more natural. Well, anyway, I, I don't like this. I don't like the Chigurin a lot. Okay, but you play bishop g4. This is more natural. Okay, it's just a blitz game. I don't want to overanalyze it, and you were talking about the end game. Yeah, Mr. Coffee c4. This is also possible. More of like a French theme. Wow, this, this actually... How are there so many games here? Suddenly like a bazillion games. There's almost a hundred games from this position. Bishop e2, quite a passive move for white. Leiko Morozevich, 2019. I mean, obviously, Mr. Coffee, yes, c4 is the sharpest. That would also transpose in some lines to a queen's gambit accepted. There is a lot of close relationship between queen's gambit accepted and the Chigorin, obviously. This, this is plausible. Um, but why give up the center necessarily? Shabalov Morozevich, 2015. Could that have been online? Now e5 is apparently like a legit gambit. Oh, you played this. Morales is playing the Morozevich gambit. Matlakov Morozevich. I mean, where does Morozevich play? Like seriously. Are these like chess.com games? I mean, I don't think Shabalov like went back to the old country to play Morozevich. Dude, where's the uh World Rapid, Berlin, Germany. Okay, 2015. Wow. So Morozevich played two inaccuracies, 20 CPL, and Chaba made a blunder and seven inaccuracies. Wow. Wow, impressive. And there's Motlikov Morozevich. Probably same tournament. No, Russian Teen Championship Rapid. They have a, a Teen Championship Rapid. And this guy just dumped, he dumped Morozevich. All right. So Malikov significantly more accurate than Shabalov. Okay. So e five. <clears throat> I mean, you don't need to do this though. You know, you don't have to be crazy. With the Russian roulette here, Morales. I mean, clearly, like e six is more principled. It's not like e3 necessarily, like, yeah, you need to play e5. Okay. Anyway, it's crazy, Morozevich. <clears throat> Apparently there's, there's a queen b3 that's possible. That looks very sharp. Wow. Definitely not a move that 2100 player on the chess is going to find. All this, with all this tension in the center, like how many, how many people are gonna play queen b three in this position? Unless their name is like Igor Novikov or something. Queen b three. Unbelievably, that guy. You know, Parlygrass has another game. Archea, he's another game. He must play this exclusively against the, the Chigorin, like e three based setups. Queen b three. 
Hmm. All right. That's a tough move to play, you know. But it's based on home analysis. So your opponent played d takes e5. So Albin style. Now, my question is, does d4 transpose to the Albin? Dude, this looks like, you know, it looks like a... Uh, It looks like a Falk B or Counter Gambit on the other side of the board. I mean, D4 has to be, it has to be a viable option. To be honest with you, you know, it seems more aggressive than, than D takes C4. But D takes C4 has a better score. Okay, so here, D takes C4 to the better score. It rhymes. Because, of course, Morales knows <clears throat> Demorozevich. And again, this guy is not going to know this, like, computer variation with Queen A4. This is a secret refutation. I don't know. I would I would wonder about D4. So queen A4 is the idea. And once he does this you're you're in the clear. So it's basically like you scammed him in the opening. Rook takes D8. Even the even the var like white wing conover New Jersey Open 1992 no. That guy played in the first tournament I ever played in. I remember. Uh, Fide Master from New Jersey. 1985. Um, Rook takes d8, Bishop takes c4, and now. Oh, you have knight c5. Oh my god. Rook d1 check. So you didn't know about knight takes c5. I mean, this is great because you don't have to give up your white square bishop. Okay. I mean, that's preferable to giving up the bishop. Bishop takes f3, you know, and now... I mean, I guess it's like equal. You're going to do Rubenstein cone here? And like win the king upon the game with your king on h3 or something. Bishop e2. Ah. Holy shit. So everybody played knight d3 check and you. You introduced a new idea with bishop b4 check. You know what's shocking to me? Like two games here were decisive in black's favor. I mean, I'm just thinking it's not that easy to lose this position with white. Like twenty two forty five against twenty three ninety five, twenty three fifty against twenty two fifty five. Knight d three check bishop takes d three, rook takes d three. Okay, black's pawn structure is a little bit better, but I mean, still, I, it should be a draw. I mean, this position, it should be a draw. Rook d seven. What is this correspondence chess? The computer actually thinks that white is better. But there's no way that white white should lose two out of two in this position. Um, so that's funny. So you didn't go for you played a new move, Bishop Check. I mean, it's not a bad idea. <clears throat> if you trade you trade the bishop pair off. I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, anyway, you're trading his bishop pair off. I mean, knight d3 is probably better because he has to trade the bishop pair off anyway. With bishop b4 check, you are trading off his bad bishop. So I thought bishop d2. Now you have to exchange. 
you don't have to right do anything maybe you could try something weird but like what you know I mean, what's the point if, if he plays bishop d2 yeah he should have played bishop d2 it looks like see this is dumb I mean he's like pinning himself That's crazy. He's pinning himself. But I think maybe his problem is that he has some kind of fantasy that he's not worse here. or I mean, that he's better a lot, better. He's playing for a, an advantage. I mean, it's approximately equal after bishop d2. I mean, what, what possible reason would you have to pin yourself with knight to d2? That's very awkward. Okay, a3 and b4, but I mean, he does. <clears throat> He's asking for it here. 93 check takes, doesn't work. So, you're not going to take the pawn on b2. So now the acid test is. Uh huh. King f1. King f1 doesn't work. So he has to take anyway. And so you were fine. And it's a draw, basically. Maybe white's a little better now, because you've, you've enabled him to put his bishop on c3. You, you helped him. I mean, you helped him essentially like develop develop his bishop. The bishop's stronger than the knight in this position. And now rook b3 would be very strange. But I mean, I've seen stranger things. Let's see. Here, here, here. Just just for kicks and giggles. Like takes here. Bishop e5, f6. Bishop d4, c5. This is too much. It's too crazy. Yeah, we can't do it. Okay, so you have to come back. And now you're worse. But he plays like a moronic move in this position. White is better. I mean, bishop c3 and white is better. This is pretty unpleasant, actually. This is not easily solved. You're going to have to be very careful here <coughs> to hold, I think. But bishop b4 is really dumb. You could just play knight d5. What the heck? Knight d5 immediately, bishop c5, b6, bishop d4, knight f4 check. What's he supposed to play? Like king f1, knight e6. You're definitely fine. You broke the whole barrier. And white is disorganized. <coughs> So I think, you know, you missed it. I mean, b6 is probably okay, too. No, maybe not. See? So you missed your your golden opportunity, knight d5. Okay, he has bishop d2. Yeah, that's a good question. What should you do? What should you do? Um, it's not obvious what you should do. I'm thinking f6, you know, f5. Castle. I mean, what are we supposed to do? You're not completely equal. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, it might be better to play this. And then on rook g1, you have, like, g6. But, you know, he's all over you here. You've got to be very careful in this position. Check. King f8. You're like playing, you know, in a minefield. You're playing football in a minefield. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's like really, really bad. You know, I think 
major inaccuracy by white, I would not give up that bishop. You still have a queenside majority. I understand the point, like your king is out of the game. Wow. Maybe that's worse than his previous move. This guy, he's got to play rook g1 check, drive you out to the side, no? That's got to be better. I mean, you still have rook g8 and you're still alive, but I mean, even he has this. So let's just say rook g1 check, king over, rook d1. Now what are you supposed to play? Rook, rook d8. And let's say rook d8, rook d8, rook g4. I mean, he's clearly better here. Even though you have a queenside majority, your king is out of the game. Still, it's within the realm of, of draw. So bishop f6, okay, it's a blitz game. I'll give him a break. But, I mean, your king being able to come up here is, is majorly, like, seriously better. Rook d1, he goes into the king and pawn ending. Okay. So. I mean, is that a good decision for white? Build the wall. In a vacuum, you have a healthy queenside majority, whereas his majority is broken up. His king is able to approach the center faster than yours, but it's your move. So king f8, okay, king d2, king e7, king d3, so now I have to wonder, I mean, could you build the wall? This is not really a problem, right? Because of like C6, I guess. So his only threat is to like come in here. So I don't know if you should put your king on E6 or D6. I guess you have to go to E6 to support F5. Or you're better off going to E6 to support F5. Who would you prefer here? Well, I don't know. I mean, theoretically, black has the better pawn majority. Um, but I, I mean, I guess white has more space. It should be a draw. You can't really trust the engine though, because it needs to calculate like depth 40. It could be like lost and it doesn't even see over the horizon. Though it doesn't feel like one side should be lost. Okay, this is really dramatic what happened now on the queen side. I mean, first of all, I thought his threat was to come in here. You play king d6. Why is this guy playing b4? Shouldn't he play this? <coughs> There's a threat of this. It's like reverse cone Rubinstein. If you can walk over here, you're dead. But you got the queen side majority, so he can't. Yeah. He can't do it. He can't go anywhere. So he just has to hang out. So the answer to the question is, I guess you'd rather be black, because black has the more active queenside majority. Neither side should win, but black is symbolically better. But b4, I mean, why is he helping you create like a passed pawn on the queen side? Now, I'm not even sure if like you should play c5 right away. I mean, it's, it's kind of early. And also, you may want to stop b5. I don't know. I'm a little bit scared of b5, but then you have a protected passer. b5, king, d5, e4, check, king, e5. So c5 looks okay. He plays king c4, okay. Now you took, which is not forced. Obviously you could play maybe, you could play a6, right? A6 is interesting. It's a draw. 0.0. 0. 0. While you're winning with C takes before. 
you're winning with CDs before, but only with CDs before. Obviously, I wouldn't have realized that if I think that A6 is a move. I didn't think you're clearly winning here. C takes B4, and you just create a pass pawn and win. Well, he can take. He can play um, king takes. Yeah, but you see his problem is, right? This is irrelevant. How does he create a pass pawn? He can't create a pass pawn. If he pushes his pawns up, you just like ignore him. So I'm just, just to illustrate, like king here, king here, whatever. You know, b5 check here. Like, I don't know, e4, a5 check, whatever, king here, king here, f4. But my point is, when we get to a situation where it's a race or whatever, when you when he plays e5, you don't have to take, you know? This is the point. Like, if you take, right, he undoubles his pawns and now he has counterplay with a but you don't have to take. He can be up, you know, three three tripled pawns, four, five, whatever, ten. And it doesn't matter. Like there's no way to go through. So his he has like a passive majority, essentially. Um, it's like a situation that happens in the Queen's uh, the, the 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 Royal Le Pass. Exchange Royal Le Pass type of thing. Passive majority doesn't matter. You just don't take. His his four on three doesn't matter, and yours is active. So he lost the game, what, with like B4? I mean, general rule, right? But general rule, you don't advance on your weak side. He's helping you create a pass pawn. But I'm curious how white draws this. Let's see. King c3, king d6, king c4, a6, f4. Now again, I don't know if you should touch your kingside pawns. c6, f3, whatever. Okay, let's say c5. So maybe you're winning. It would be funny if you're just winning. a4. I don't understand if we have to play f5. So f5 apparently is important here. Okay, it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter, f5. It's a tempo. You're winning. No, it looks like you're winning, man. You're winning. Wow. So, I mean, it's possible that the whole king and pawn game is winning. And the computer just can't see the horizon. So it's it's really possible it's winning. Oddly enough, King G seven. Holy shit! You can do Rubinstein Cohen to him. Oh no. Well, let's just see if you play King G seven. King E two. King G six. <laughs> he has this. No. E four. This is like a very improved version of Rubinstein Cohen. Why can't you play like King G five? King e3, king h4, he has this. Okay, so, sorry, you can lose. I see. You you have to outweigh them here. Very interesting stuff. But it looks like you're winning. I don't see a way white can draw. Just a matter of time till you create your passed pawn. Clearly, like, b4 is a mistake. I would have tried king e4. He's eventually going to run out of moves. I think it's winning. So what happened in the game? You played... Um, yeah, I mean, this is like not normal to exchange rooks off with, with the opponent having a pawn majority. It looks like you played it fine. What did you do? Allow him, like, some sort of play? Uh-oh. Is f6 okay? 
Oh my god, it's not okay. So this is this is how he's gonna undouble his pawns. That's very instructive. So if you just play like which move is the best though? King king here? B five check. Pawn takes pawn check, king b four. How do you win here? If you can't play f six? King here. You don't win? You don't win? Okay, so h4. Can you win? You misplayed the queen side somehow. Oh, b5 check. You can do b5 check. King d4, king c6. But this is a mess. I mean, this could get crazy now. So you miss you misplayed your your queen side pawns. Let's say when he plays f4, play f5, he plays this. Okay. You don't need to do anything there. You need to, well, okay, he runs out of moves. a5. <clears throat> takes, takes, king b5, king d5, king a5, king c4, king b6, king d3. This type of stuff, you know. Can you just make him run out on the side? It's winning. A5 is winning. Yeah, I mean, you just have to get him to decoy over there. When you played f6, it was a catastrophic blunder. Suddenly he can undouble his pawns. Phew. So e5 is the point. He'll have protected past pawn. So, I guess you, you like, you don't have to lose. What should you play? Just king e6, right? King e6. King e6. And now e5. After king e6... Actually, maybe he, he shouldn't do king. He shouldn't do e5. Your king is out of position now. You can't go around. So he might just wait or something. If you try to make a break for it, you know, now, now you're too slow to come around. King e6, king a5, king c5, I don't know. Now he has e5. This is complicated, though. This would be crazy, like take, take, f4, e6, wow, wow, king d6, and white's winning, oh my god, that's a nightmare, that's a nightmare, holy shit, white's winning, wow, that would be really devastating. If you tried to win and lost there, so this is like a draw. You're totally winning. Now it's a draw, and you should play king e6. 
or something like that, and you play and you played a5, and that's how you lost. Is this still not lost? How is this not lost now? He played e5 check. Whoa. So king c4, king c6. Oh. Wow. So it's still a draw. Wow. He has to go back here. This is crazy. a4, king c4. a3, king b3. f4 takes. King c5. Very complicated. So he actually blundered again. And you resigned. Wow. So amazingly, oh my god, what a position. You're winning after king e7 or king e6. That's insane. Wow. You guys both have plenty of time. More than a minute left. Take, take, protected pass pawn. It's just a protected pass pawn. That's all you need to think about. You can't let him have a protected pass pawn. So it was like blunder, blunder, blunder. Wow. And at four and it's over. So you just resigned here. You didn't even wait for him. I mean, you didn't even wait for him to play f4. Well, I guess it's... I would, you know, I would play... Um, if you play king e6, this guy's going to play f4 for sure, and it's over. But if you're smart, you play king c6, and you kind of scare him into playing king c4, and then you're winning, you know, with f4. You shouldn't have resigned. I mean, I, I still think there's a chance. If you're tricky here and you play this, there's like a 1% chance that he might panic and play like something wrong you know not play f4 okay he's in the square of the pawn he has a he has a very obvious protected passer it's over but with this move it's very clear you know he's on you're on the pawn he has to play f4 if you like ignore the pawn he may forget that you can play f4 i mean i think that's that's the point you know if he like sits back and relaxes and plays like this or something you like f4. Guess what? You don't have protected pass pawn. Yeah, no. Nice, nice idea. Okay, so Sung Prism, what time is it? Nine o'clock. Well, I'm kidding. Astrobeat donated a, a gift sub. Thanks, Miles. That was a really cool that was a really cru cool cool uh, cruel. Cruel and cool. Cruel and cool uh Cruel and cool. Um, what am I doing? Okay, cross table. Move times. Share and export. Um, game as GIF. Download raw. Download. Annotated. Wait a second. I don't need to do that. Copy and paste. Copy and paste is always easier. Um, all right. <clears throat> Add a new chapter. Heavily annotated by the computer or whatever, but we'll try to ignore the annotations. This is on. Um, <clears throat> what was this from? Lee Chess 30 unit game? Rated classical game? French defense. Yeah, thanks, uh, Morales. Well, I mean, I usually lose rook in games. Or Rook and Bishop end games. All right, so this is our last subscriber game for today. E four, E six. Do we get a donation or something? 
Antonio Morales tip five dollars. We're up to thirty. We're up to thirty-five dollars. Just deduct sixty euros from, or sixty dollars from the total. Nils tries to take credit for donations, but he's paying for lessons. He wants to look like a nice guy. He is a nice guy. All right. E4, E6, C4. I can't change the donation goal. So we have to go over the goal by $60. All right, so the opponent plays C4. This move shouldn't be underestimated. I hate the French defense because it leads to very closed positions. So if you want to avoid closed positions, this is one of White's best options. Maybe it's best to play D4, D5, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, C4, you know. All right, on c4, you could play c5. Like I lost to Ariel Mengarini back in 1989, 88 or something. 1988, I don't remember. Somewhere between 87 and 89, 88. I didn't know what I was doing. And you played like knight f3. I, I, I don't remember. I made... I made some kind of mistake here. This should be fine for black if you play accurately. Okay, but you're 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 taking it in a French defense style. Now, um, normally, E D is more common, I would think. Okay, this is a move. Now, I'm just trying to think: is there anything weird we could do here? You know, like. Knight f6 or something. Knight f6 is dubious because of like bishop b5 check. So we have to take. And now white has to take. There probably are some people who will go here occasionally. Um, Nick Nolte has a game. And I don't recommend f6. I mean, this looks a little bit much. Um, I have to make a confession though. Like lately I've had some games where I'm, I'm playing like unrated. And I'll play like. What? How would this go? Um, how would this go? E four C five. How do I get this E four? No, e, no Scandinavian. Right. I'll play the Scandinavian. They'll play E five, and I can't resist playing F six. I, I mean, really, like who? Who the heck plays E five against the Scandinavian? I've had a number of games like that. I, I just can't. I can't stop myself. You know, if you're dumb enough to play, like, e5 against the Scandinavian, I can get away with playing f6 against you. That's my that's my theory, anyway. Um, it's not the best move for black, but... Okay, so, we transpose to this takes, takes, takes. So now, you know, you're supposed to play knight f6, I guess? The same idea in the Karo Khan. The pawn's not going anywhere. And white, you know, white has a lot of weaknesses on the light squares, I would say. There's been some major volcanic activity on the white squares in this position. So you need to develop your kingside anyway. This is a kind of no-brainer. And now the only way, you know, white could try to keep the pawn or something with some greedy move like this should be five check. Now I don't know. I'm sure that black is fine, but I've never actually looked at this. Just similar lines in the Karo Khan. I think you could probably play literally anything but knight f d7 here and be okay. The idea is to take with the knight. Yeah, yeah. But the question is, if bishop b5 check, do we A, interpose the bishop, interpose the knight, or do we play like Harry Lyman and do like c6? I know this looks crazy, but to be honest with you, like even this is probably not that bad for black. Because, again, I mean, he has a lot of weaknesses. I imagine this is really not that bad. Knight d7. Right, most aggressive, because you're not trading any pieces. But I think on the other hand, move 11, um, the light square bishop exchange is favorable for black. 
That's white's kind of good bishop. I think the problem could could come in where we get bishop d7, bishop c4, right? This is the problem. It's like they fake you out, you know. I do that with the dog when I'm playing catch, you know, you fake the dog out, you like here's the ball, here's the ball, here's the ball, and then you throw it over there. It's like you're gonna trade the bishop, nope. Just kidding, bishop c4. Oh, it's like a lot like a Scandinavian though. You know, black has a bad score here because people don't know how to play the Scandinavian who played the French defense, right? I mean, that's why it's why white score is so crushing here. Probably black's position is, isn't that bad. You know, unless Morales like busts an exchange sack on you or something. I mean, honestly, but in in a Scandinavian, we'd have the same position where b5 would be playable, but b5 loses here to queen e2 check? Or no? Is it? It's not, right? I could play this. Oh, this happened in a game. Wow. Yeah, but b5 is really kind of crazy. <clears throat> Let's see what the computer says. See? Black's totally within the within the realm of, of, of a holdable position. b5 is even a move. Look how bad black score is. Only because French defense players don't know how to play the Scandinavian. Okay. They don't know how to play the knight of six Scandinavian. Um, so this is an interesting line from white from that perspective. Yeah, knight on bd7 is best, it looks like. And this is following some, some high-level games. Vacher has played this a number of times, with good results, notably. He beat Caruana and Bacro, and that other guy. He's beat three decent players. Um, all right, but anyways. Now, on the other hand, this position is too open for a lot of French players, I guess. Well, that's why, yeah, we're doing this stuff with white. Unfortunately, this move, you know, just doesn't cut it because of, like, it should be five check, I guess. What we don't want to end up is this type of position where our pawn is on e6. I suppose. You know, even this is weird, but... Okay, take, 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 take. And this isn't really dubious. You know, I think... Maybe the Karo Khan... The Karo Khan version is better. So let's say e4, c6. c4, d5 takes, 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 queen takes. This is better for black. Because we have the e-pawn protect our king, and the e-file is not open. And even though we're going to lose the tempo with knight c3, you get like a standard IQP position. Um, I would argue that this position is okay for black. Is it the same with the queen on d5? See, Onishuk, Ian Rogers, 1997. That's Karo Khan version. So is there Ian Rogers in the, in the list here? No. Is there anyone over 2,500 in the list here for black? No. 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 Though now he is. No. 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 And it's just going down. How bad can it be, right? Okay, so knight c3, where do you go? Um, I'm gonna recommend queen d8. You went to a5 like a Scandinavian, but... I, I think you got to go to d8 here. Maybe d7. It hasn't been tried. I'm going to bet. If you guys want to bet. You want to bet? On queen d7. Queen d7, knight f3, threatening knight e5. Still might be a problem. But I'm going to go out on the limb. This is kind of crazy. But I'm going to say that queen d7 is black's second best move. I'm probably wrong. But I feel like gambling. I'm going to say black's best move is queen d8, and the second best move is queen d7. Novelty. It's not... 
it's just not that easy to exploit the, the position of the queen here. You know, this is harmless. Bishop e5 is harmless. And knight f3 can be met by bishop d6. And we're going to get out of here. You know, we're going to get out with knight e7 or knight f6 and we're going to castle. And black has a playable position, if not great. But anywhere else you put the queen, you're going to come under fire. a5 is definitely, like, probably third best. I would say it's probably queen d8 is the best, queen d7 second best, queen a5 is third best. Let's see. I'm wrong. But okay, we give it give it a little time. Wow. I only have two lines. Let's let's make it three. Search time, eight seconds. Multiple lines, three. I'm gonna be proven wrong here. It's still my computer sucks, so it needs extra time. Um, it's got a very weak processor. Queen d8 might overtake um, queen a5, but it looks like I was wrong about queen d7. I don't get why he hates queen d7. It obstructs our bishop, okay, but still. Queen d6 looks more dangerous. Let's say, I still don't believe it. Queen a5 isn't so bad, okay. Queen d7, knight f3. What's the problem with bishop d6 here? d4, knight e7. Bishop c4, castles. Okay, well, I mean, it's playable. It's just not, not great. So queen a5 isn't as bad as we thought. It's actually the computer's favorite move. I, I don't know. I mean, I would definitely play queen d8. And I think that queen d6 is more dangerous than, than a normal queen d6 Scandinavian. Because the position's more open, I would think this would be more dangerous. All right, I've been proven wrong. Um... By the computer. By the way, I just want to I want to add one thing. Like, if we play a normal Scandinavian, has anyone ever played Queen D seven? No. The new, the new, the new Queen D seven. I played it once in the Blitz game. I mean, it's it's a funny move, but Knight F three. There's no Bishop D six here. See. It's not that bad if you want to play a weird move. All right. Anyway. So let's see the game. Game is queen a5. And now we've got an open Scandinavian. Knight f6 is good. Now this move is in inexplainable. Like, it's an open position. And you're going to play h3. That's very slow, you know. You have an isolated queen pawn. It's a very open game. Your king is in the center. Enemy king is in the center. And you're playing h3. This is not the situation for h3. Tiny computer fun drive. To put in my shoe. To put in my, in my ski boots. That I'm going to wear to the board. I saw this guy in the airport in Istanbul. Just standing at the coffee shop, like, literally wearing ski boots. I, I, I had to do, like, a double take. I was like, whoa. I guess he didn't want to pack him in his luggage or check him or something like that. So he was actually wearing, like, ski boots. Um, well, not just ski boots, but instead of normal shoes. He's just hanging out in the airport with his ski boots on. And I thought, you know, <clears throat> if I'm going to cheat at a chess tournament, that would afford me a lot of space, maybe, to, s to stick stuff in there, you know. They look like they have a lot of room. They're very roomy. So I'll have to ask Hans, but we probably had the most room with ski boots. Like, normal boots is pretty good, but if you need footwear to give you lots of space, um, H3 is a bad move, slow. You know, so now I think it's all business. Time to develop the pieces. Normally I would go king side, but you have to consider the possibility of queen e2 check. Now one thing is that we don't have, we don't have queen e7. So if you play like bishop d6, what are you going to do if this guy goes queen e2 check? You get your jababa out, right? You strap on your, 
strap on the angry, you know, tilt rage and, and you play king d8. You know, I guess this is the question. No, I mean, a rational person would probably play king f8 here, but I bet Jabava would go king d8 and then play for rook e8. No, I'm, I'm getting tired, so I'm saying crazy shit now. Um, this is a very aggressive move by black, though, you know, and it's probably good. How's our, uh, has this game been analyzed? It has. Request computer analysis. It's already been analyzed. What do you mean? I have analysis right there. Was it analyzed on chess.com or something? I mean, why, why does it not have an analysis already? There's like a million annotations in the, there it is. Black with two mistakes, one inaccuracy. Two mistakes? Where are they? Why is it not showing? Let me try to reload this. Our mistakes are right there. And then uh, one inaccuracy. Hmm. So Bishop B6, I mean, you're, you're playing like a Scandinavian. You're a French defense player who, who seems to be adapting to the Scandinavian really well. An unusually good Scandinavian adapter. I would think most French players would be ha heading for the hills here by now. I mean, they'd have been like playing bishop e4, bishop e7. Bishop e7, I mean, this is the safest, right? Bishop e7, now queen e2 can just be ignored by castles. And then after queen e7, we win as queen. So I think the standard, well, the, the standard French defense player wouldn't have played queen a5 in the first place. And if they did, they would probably play bishop e7. Don't talk about that. Asperate, if you if you mention chicken fried steak again, I'm gonna have to like have you banned. No mentioning of delicious foods on my stream while I'm hungry. This should be five and now queen b six. Castle's queen side involves some risk, but it would be consistent. Unfortunately, like white escapes from the planet of the apes here, and we're stuck on the planet of the apes. You know. Ultimately, black's king safety is the bigger issue, I think. Even though white doesn't have a light square bishop, you're still going to have to be more careful. This is a very risky methodology. So I I don't know. I mean, I probably would have played bishop b4. And then white would castle. And if you take, he takes with check. And then you take, and then he takes there. And if you grab the pawn, you know you're being very materialistic, so you should probably castle. And I would evaluate this as probably kind of equal-ish. The computer says white is a tiny bit better, which I think is fair, but only a tiny bit better. So that's like the safe way to play if you're, if you're a French defense player. But our hero plays queen b6, which is preventing the doubling of pawns. <clears throat> Now white's supposed to castle. And now you play castle's queen side. Whoa. Thematic. And you allowed the pawn fork. I mean, you're going to pin him. White. I mean, I would think white would sack a pawn. Castle, bishop e3. Maybe play bishop e3 first, right? To develop a piece. Then you're going, what? Bishop c5? You have bishop c5? Are you freaking kidding me? You have bishop c5. So bishop b3 is nothing, I guess. Nothing special. You just happen to have bishop c5 there. So bishop takes c6, b takes c, castles, and... Black's king is not really safe, but black's winning a central pawn. 
so then I have no idea how to take. I mean, I, I would love to take here with the pawn from the perspective of a pawn structure, but this is not in a normal position. I mean, black's king is on c8, and there's an open c file, and I have no idea, you know. Maybe trading pieces seems reasonable. Bishop takes is possible. That's a valuable piece, though. So knight takes, threatening discoveries. And if, if he takes, I think you're in really good position here with the, the wooden shield. I would probably take with the bishop, uh, Hikaru's favorite term. But um, certainly not forced. So knight takes queen a4, that's a good move, I would think. Avoiding any exchange of queens. Knight c3, I don't know. Knight c3 looks... Knight c3 looks kind of insane. I mean, you're opening up the b-file for the opponent here. Wow. So your idea was to play knight c3, b takes c, and play bishop f5, and prevent him from using the b-file. Which makes sense. White, you know, white has bishop e3. in some positions. I mean, this move looks dangerous to me. You're you're trading off powerful centralized piece, and, and again, the b-file is dangerous. So that was the plan. Now he has some point. This is going to be a problem. So you played bishop f5. I mean, I have no idea what I would do here. I would probably try to trade queens. I hang my a-pawn. This is not an easy position to play for black. But bishop c5 has something to do with uh, self-preservation. Protecting a7. No, I mean, maybe bishop c5 is the only move that really guarantees protection of, of a7. Material really doesn't matter much here, so I would think like white realistically should very, very seriously consider knight d4. And, you know, pawns matter nothing here. So, like, take, 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 queen a3. And the fact that you're up two double pawns has vir virtually no meaning in the position with ops colored bishops and the fact the pawns are double isolated and your king is completely open on the other side of the board. White is clearly, clear, clearly better. White would be likely to win. Um, so, yeah, I think the position is unclear. Bishop c5, knight d4, and I know it's easier to play, easier to play white, probably, because his king is safer than yours. But bishop f5, okay. First of all, there's knight d4, which is a, a strong idea anyway. And now he has this, and now you play bishop c5, which was the point, right? Now the question is, should he exchange bishops, or should he play knight d4? <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really strange move by white, a very strange move. I mean, while well, queen is here, it's attacking a7, it's attacking this. It's threatening a6 square, which might be useful. You gotta wonder, like, why would this guy play queen f4? He just wants to attack things with check. Huh. Yeah, it's just, it's a weird move. It's like a one move threat type of move. Doesn't doesn't look right. And now bishop g6, keeping an eye on b1. And then he plays knight e5. And now you took. And the more pieces you trade, the better. Bishop takes, f takes. Obviously, if he trades queens, you're you're fine. And now, um, again, want to trade trade stuff. So I would expect you to play this, but there's some tactic like check knight e seven. This is a crazy situation. I mean, there's check here. I don't know if you want to play f5. It's not ideal, but maybe you can. 
I want to know why you played this rook rather than the other rook. Is there some tactical reason? It's like your your D rook is already developed. It's really weird. It's weird to play that rook when your rook is out of play. And then a very strange thing happens. Well, he gives up the knight for the bishop, but you know, you take with the H pawn. I mean, I don't see any future here for this. You know, seriously. Maybe there's a definite reason, though. There is. Okay, so you have to, because if you take this way, check, and your king is dead. Okay. He has rook b1. Now, you, you had to take the other way. You have to be able to meet queen g4 check with f5. Queen g4 check, black's only move is rook e6 or f5. f5. It looks like black's in deep shit. But maybe you can hang on. You know, you're going to pick off this pawn with check, and you've got sacks on e3. For example, takes here, check. King h1. I don't know. I don't see the, the rook sack working. It doesn't. So you'd be in a difficult situation here. So he plays queen takes f7. Now obviously this is queen f2 time. After queen f2, it's it's equal. You have two sets of double isolated pawns. This is okay. You grab a pawn. Now you have a check on e5. And again, white needs to be careful. It just grabs another pawn. And now, ooh. Wow. Check. That's brutal. So he has to play king g1. Doesn't he? So king h1, what? He's not lost here. What, are you kidding me? It's a draw? Oh, no. No, that's mate. King h1. No, he has to sack the queen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. He has to sack his queen. And creates a force field. Uh huh. Right. Queen e5 check. King h1 takes, takes. The rubber band effect. Like, your pawns are never going to go through. So you have no real winning chances. It just should be a draw. It's a draw. Wow, so he missed this tactic that smoked him. Computer says you're better, though. Are you really better there? I mean, why? Queen g2, queen e5 check, king h1, rook g2, king g2. Does he seriously have winning chances? You seriously have winning chances here. Wow. Rook c1. If you win the a2 pawn with check, you have winning chances. It's not a simple draw. That's a nice tactic, though. Rook takes h3. Check, king g1, and then he gets mated. Slight problem. Hmm. Well, that was certainly an interesting game. I enjoyed it. All right. So, wrapping it up, last games, last call, move 11, you didn't submit a game, did you? Asterbeat started talking about, Asterbeat started talking about chicken fried steak, man, don't do that. That's very possible, yeah, I, I, I oftentimes feel like I don't understand what, what's happening during the game, too. Um, principle of two weaknesses, open king and pass pawn. I mean, 
mean, in a slightly different position, it should be a, a draw, but... Yeah, that queen ending is kind of weird. Black, black can maybe get active with the king. If you have two passed pawns, it would get really messy. If, if white could hold his A pawn here, white doesn't lose that and just creates a rubber band with the two rooks, you know, like on the second rank. It's kind of hard to imagine. It's a little hard to imagine how, how we win, but maybe black could go somehow getting the king active too. All right. Um, that's it then. I'm going to go get some dinner. I'm going to be back on Sunday, guys, with... Uh, Master B, thanks for tipping 567. Also, GM Carlos Obregon has followed. See, I said... I told you guys, Grandmaster is usually anonymously watch my stream. That's who most of those viewers are. They never admit it. Did I kill the mosquito? No, but I think my mosquito, like... The mosquito thing I plugged in mosquito anti-mosquito plug seems to be working because it it stopped attacking me like it, it made it malfunction or something maybe it's one of those Russian you know mosquito drones oh no Casper Pollock has raided with a party of 29 just as I'm ending the stream Casper Pollock raiding with a party of 29 now what am I gonna do are you serious I can't leave. Casper is raiding with party 29. Thank you for raiding with party of 29. Now what am I going to do? Parmenides just got a gift sub from all this action. All right. Um, Astrobeat sent us over 100 well, actually $40. The real donation bar is $40. Someone paid for lessons by donating $60. Don't worry about it, but... Thank you for the for the raid from Casper. Um, guys, I, I'll go for a game then. I have no choice now. Um, I'll show you guys a game that I played. <laughs> this hurts. So now I can't leave the stream because we had a raid. This is a game from the last round of the World Senior that I lost. If I won the game, I could theoretically win a bronze medal. Um, it's again our French defense exchange variation. So this is round 11 from the World Senior last week. My opponent played e4. This is the first Grandmaster that's played e4 against me since last year. More than a year ago, not one GM ever played e4 against me. I'm not sure anybody played e4 against me. No, no, other people did, just no Grandmasters. All the GMs I played in the last year, which is like six or seven, everyone played Everyone got, almost everyone got white, but who was white always played d4 or knight f3. So the guy plays e4 against me, and he, you know, he he uh, had a very quick draw on the Petrov against Adelik. e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight e5, d6, knight f3, knight takes e4, and like, before the game, I had considered the Nimzovich variation is possible. Main line, uh... And maybe like queen e2 or something weird. But I totally... By the way, welcome to everyone who's just raided. Um, I totally missed um, this stupid variation with d3. Carlsen is to blame. Well, actually, it looks like Carlsen played it in 2017. So everyone has played it at some point. Carlsen played it in 2016. This is like, you know, it's so gross to face this. So knight f6, white plays d4, and now I knew like this move existed, but whatever. So d5, bishop d3, and now what should black play? I never studied this. I mean, nobody ever plays it against me when I played the Petrov. I never really took it seriously, the exchange variation of the French. But I didn't really know exactly what kind of setup to do, so I was a bit of in a quandary here. Like I was, I was afraid. I don't know what to do on like bishop d six, bishop g five. They play this. Why you know? There's no no good players play the exchange variation against the French. I don't know what to do there. You know, how do you break this pin? Apparently, like you just castle. 
Well, he plays castles, and he, like, copycat with bishop g4. It's just, like, ridiculous. So what if I were to do, like, h3? No, he can't. Yeah, you just castle. You just keep copying the opponent. Anyway, um, I played bishop b7. My opponent plays h3, preventing bishop g4. I played this. And people were like, oh, what is that, you know? But my friend Zako had played this a number of times. So I used this maneuver that's borrowed from the Queen's Gambit. Knight d7, castles, knight f8. Rook e1, knight e6. And now Novik played the same move that Fogarashi played, as you can see, in one of the games, this game from 2006. I mean, how many moves does White have in this position, you know? c3, c4, knight d2. I mean, there's just not that many options. So, c4. And now, I didn't really like Ilinchich's castle because I, um, I was afraid of c takes d. You know, I didn't like my knight getting driven away from protecting the king side. Here, knight takes. Um, so I, and this is passive, like c5. So I play takes, takes, then c6, stopping d5. If white, if white plays, I'm sorry, if black plays castles, he has d5. And now my knight is like on a weird, weird square here. So c6 here, castles, and now bishop e3, protecting this. Black to play, knight c7. So I have everything, everything blockading the isolated pawn at d4. Everything is okay. I'm threatening to play bishop e6. Trade off, trade off my opponent's good bishop. And by the way, the problem with this game was it was the last round of the world senior. The winner could possibly get a, a bronze medal. But the problem was, like, my opponent had much, 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 much better tie breaks than me. So if I lose, I get nothing. If he loses, he gets some kind of consolation prize, like 500 euros or something. So it was, like, awkward because, you know, he can actually play for a win, still lose, and, and, and finish with the same, you know, the same score and still win a prize. So I, he wasn't, like, playing for a draw. I wasn't, you know, I couldn't offer a draw. Queen b3 and now b5. Peter doesn't like this move. The engine actually suggested a5. I mean, I thought of this, right? a5, a4. It's like a semi-slav trick. A5, A4, Knight A4, B5 working as pieces. But I was concerned about the B6 square being kind of soft. I didn't know if I should do this, so I did B5. And now Novik missed his best move, Bishop D3. Because we both thought that Black has C5. But, like, this move is not tactically sound, it turns out. Although my opponent, like, plays quickly and doesn't calculate that much, I think. Um, he's more of a practical player, very, you know, Magnus Carlsen style. Um, but I bluffed him, so he plays bishop f1, and now I gain a tempo, and now I go here, and I'm like blockading the square, and then he plays the move I thought he would play. He goes, he goes with the acerbate, the acerbate on h7, right? Looks good, except, well, I mean, I could take his bishop, but I like this better, because I, like, can drive him off the diagonal. If he takes this, he's, like, losing the exchange. So he has to go here, and then I played this. And I get to exchange off the bad bishop, you know, my bad bishop for his good bishop, and I think that I was fine. Everything was fine until my endgame technique started to kick in. This is the last run game, and like the other top boards are all finishing pretty early. And now I have the pawn structure. This is ugly, but it's like an Aliakin's defense, where you have pawn on c4, supporting knight on d3. Take, take. He retreats after a long thought, and then... I thought I was, like, better. 
So check this out with the computer. At this point, I thought I was better because my pawns are hard to attack and I have more active chances. But the computer is like, uh uh. Stockfish is like, nope. White is still better. White is still better here. With the queen on b1, I mean, this is crazy, right? His queen is on b1. His rook is on a1, blocked in. My knight is coming into d3. His bishop is blocked by his own pawns. His rook is blocked by his bishop. I just feel like like this piece has a problem, this piece has a problem, this piece has problems, this piece has a problem. How is black possibly worse in this position? Like if I drop a pawn or something. So I should have played like this apparently. But I did this. He moves his rook. And then I played like the most natural move now. Still it's not equal. Oh, no, wait. No, I equalized. I equalized. I equalized, but I was supposed to play knight d5 first. And now, watch this. I played the most natural move ever, rook b8. And my opponent has, obviously, b3. And now this is hanging. I mean, I'm threatening, like, bishop a3, bishop b2. I figured, oh my god, there's some kind of tactic, you know? I was afraid, like, I could literally miss a winning move here and, and just completely overlook it or something. So, I looked at everything. Queen a5, bishop b4, bishop a3, knight, knight d5. This is supposed to be, like, my best move now. Not easy to find. And check out this variation. Here, he plays this. I take, he takes, I play this. He takes. I take, he takes my pawn on a7, I move my rook, he plays bishop d4, I play queen h4, and he sacks the exchange with rook takes d3. And I analyze this with the computer after the game. I think that white is better, actually. I, I, don't, I, don't, would, I, I don't think I would have done this. I wouldn't have wanted to go into this. So, not even sure, you know, if it's so great after all. The engine says white is clearly better. So I don't know what I can do better there. It's not clear to me what I'm supposed to do. It just doesn't look like I'm equal when you really boil it down. Queen e8. Of course, queen e8. I mean, who wouldn't play queen e8? I already did that, like, against Sulava. Sulava. Um, Sarua. Uh, I did that, and in a, in a, it was a blunder, like, five rounds ago. So black's still not equal. It's unbelievable. I'm, I'm very active here. So knight d5, knight d5, pawn d5. Knight d5, knight d5, pawn e5. And now black to play. What's the best move for black? The whole position has transformed. I have a, a really powerful pass pawn. An almost pass pawn at c4. His rook is still boxed in. Um, he's attacking my a7 pawn. Material is equal. My king is safe. He now has a pawn in e5 that can like wedge itself on e6. So I was nervous about this. But in retrospect, I think maybe I should have played queen d7. If I had played queen d7, you know... I keep him off of f5, so his queen stays, like, out of the game, essentially. But I start to be worried about the clock, so I make this move, queen a5, keeping everything protected. Queen e7 does the same thing, just prevents queen f5 as well. So here, here, and then I found, it took me, like, five minutes or eight minutes to find the best move now for black. And by that time, I was in time pressure. Now, queen a6. Yeah, that literally took eight minutes. Blockading, leaving my d5 pawn hanging. Takes, takes, and now rook d7. My bishop's attacked. Black to play. Rook b7. Rook d1. So I think it was here. 
Black to play the best move is g6. First, and if queen g4, h5, queen e4, queen e6, I sacrifice the a pawn. And then I set this up and I try to push my pawn. But the game was interesting, right? Okay, so rook b7, rook d1, g6, it's an inferior, queen e4. Even after I played like an idiot, now I blundered. I had to find a really strong move now. Rook d7, rook d7, again, sacking a pawn. Queen e6, rook a7, and something like, I think rook c8. But you guys watch what happens. So he does, I do rook fb8 now. Now check out white has a nearly winning position here. White to play, and he misses it. Even though material is equal, he can play rook takes b7, rook takes b7, e6. Now my rook's hanging if I take with the queen. I would have to take with the pawn or play f5. So the computer says I would have had to have played f5 to stay alive. Well, this is not a good development for black. If I, if I take with the pawn, which was my intention, he has bishop h6 and black is just lost. Just lost. Because my king is totally open. And that's the problem with that e-pawn. You know, here, he plays queen e5 and rook d8. I'm just lost, and he totally missed it. He's trying to play too fast, and he plays this cheap bow, bishop f4, which is just bad. His bishop was great on e3. Cheap bow doesn't work. Rook d7, rook d7. And now I could have played bishop c5, which is more active. So I played this, and now e6 doesn't work. Because if queen e6, queen e6, rook b1 check, my rook's not hanging. So he's stuck, you know, he, he didn't plan it out right. Queen d5, queen e6, queen e6, f e6. And now I expected that Novik would play rook c7. You know, he would go behind the dangerous pawn and probably, I'm worse, but I would somehow hang on to draw or something. In fact, like, I don't even know about this. Like, say... Say, um, rook c7. And say I were to play a6 and he took here. I mean, what would happen here? Is this, is this lost for black? Because I don't think so. I think this is a draw. Every single one of my pawns is on the right color. And, and the guy has his pawn, like, locked on e5. This is, I had an endgame like this against Vital Levente once. I don't think this is a win for white. Maybe. Bishop h6, let's see. Bishop h6, king f7. Maybe it's a win. I'm skeptical, though. Possibly it's winning. All right, I don't want to I don't want to trade rooks anyway. Um, so he plays rook c7? No, he plays rook takes a7, and I made a funny face at him. I thought it was a weird move. And then immediately I blundered. That's what you get for, like, being skeptical of your opponent and making a funny face. Like you immediately make the wrong move. I was overconfident. Astrobate gifting five. Thank you. Finvar, Blobix, Fortuna Chess Coach, Xerox, and Lady in Black. Don't ever be overconfident. So what's the best move for black? Well, you can, you can cheat by looking at the analysis. I was like... I still wouldn't have won a medal, because I would have only drawn with best play. But I'm so bad at end games, I blew this. So I have four minutes and my opponent has 19. And we have five more moves to make the time control. Thank you, Astrobate. If I had enough time, I would hold this ending. My pass pawn is very strong. My pawns are on the right color. But all I did was like make this sort of biased biased move based on general principles you know always put rook behind past pawn so I did it you know I did rook c8 like a moron and now my opponent is able to get his king kind of into the square of the pawn here the point is he can blockade with bishop c1 it's not it's not like there's no bishops on the board if there's bishops on the board, white is almost losing here. 
if there's no bishops on the board. But I could have played rook b1 check, king h2, and a very active counterplay. And I didn't do it. It's unbelievable. Bishop c5 also. So rook c8, question mark, king f1. And then I just start to play like an idiot. This also bad. Because he has a really strong move now. I wanted to tie his bishop down to g7 to tie him down to e5. He has rook a5, which I totally missed. <laughs> it's just like the relieving of the guard. He just like protects his pawn. Now his bishop can come back. What's the problem? So bishop g7 was a total waste of time. I should have played like rook b8 back or something. Or c3, anything is better than what I did. Bishop g7. But just to show you, even against the Grandmaster in a medal or, you know, final round game that's very important in a in a world senior championship, he he still gave me chances, even after misplaying this. Bishop f8, king e2, rook b8, bishop e3, that's where it should have been in the first place. Look how powerful this bishop is. It protects f2. It guards against the passer. It's like super bishop. His bad bishop like won the game by being super bishop. But still I have a chance to save the game. Check. King f3. And that's the problem, like making time control. I made the 40th move, and I think I still might not be lost. But it's really crazy. I've actually analyzed this out to like a, a fortress draw. With uh, you guys got to see this. I've analyzed this out to a fortress draw with queen versus rook and two pawns. So watch this. C3, rook a8, king f7, king e4, c2, king d3, queen, knight, whatever. King takes, rook takes f2, a4. Rook takes g2. Rook a7, check. King g8, a5. This is with computer and me. Um, whatever. Okay, queen, it doesn't matter. It's the same line. Rook a7, check. King g8, a4, rook g2, rook a2, rook a8, king f7, check. King e8, rook a8, check. King f7, king e3. He can't get away from my rook. So it's like check, king e4, check, king d3, check, king e2. He has to go over here. King d1, rook a1, check, king c2, rook a2, king c1, rook e2. I keep harassing him. Bishop takes, bishop d4, rook e4, bishop b6. So finally, what the point is, what happens at the end is I have to sacrifice something to stop his A pawn. So I play rook takes e5, and now a6. And then how do I stop it? You know, you can't stop it, right? With either of the pieces, I can't stop his A pawn. And he's threatening rook takes f8 check. But I have bishop c5. So if he takes it, I take the check, and I get behind his a pawn. And it's probably some kind of theoretical draw. But he has a7. So this is the point. Bishop c5, a7. Bishop takes b6. Rook f8 check. King f8, a8, queen check. King f7, queen b7 check. I lose the bishop. King f6, queen takes b6, rook h5. And now my rook has these two squares to like revolve back and forth through perpetually. All I need to do is get my king back to g7 and it's a fortress draw. And I, I don't think he can prevent me from doing it really. I think the computer says it's a draw. It can't win. It's doing queen f2 check, king g7. Now there's no way for white to win. I just leave my king here. He can't get in behind me, and I just move back and forth. But that's crazy, you know. After all the bad moves I played in ascending, it's still not a win from white. Um... So in the game, what did I do? First, I put my rook behind the pawn. Then I went back, and I went down, and I went active with my rook. Then I brought my rook back. So this is move 41. I spent 10 minutes on the next blunder. Rook b8. 
and then um, I'm lost. Apparently I'm lost, but it's not that easy. I go back behind the pawn. He builds a bridge with his king, right? Goes over here. Check here. Takes, takes, and now it's a rook ending. Rook takes, rook takes. And would you believe that he still managed to almost blow this? All he has to do is play a4, and I was, like, almost going to resign. But he actually, like, thought and thought and thought, and he eventually played, he thought seven minutes. He plays king d3. Passively, materialistically defending his pawn in e3. And this gives me a chance to save the game. I still think maybe I'm lost, but I'm not sure. I think it's probably lost, but very hard. Check, here, here, and then g4. And now, I don't know, I think that I might still be lost, but it's not easy. Because I can get my rook down over here and get my king into the game, finally. Mr. Coffee. I'll never make fun of you for not activating your king and ending again. I mean, seriously. I'll never criticize you for not activating your king. I mean, this is the worst example I've ever seen of someone not activating their king. Cement shoes. I mean, I guess deep down, like, I thought I was lost anyway, so it didn't matter, and I was running out of time. But it's amazing that, like, Still Black has a chance here. It's just like his outside pawn is so powerful. Um, but I think the best move is something like Rook C5. Or maybe just not moving the Rook at all, but King F7. The engine evaluates like it's not necessarily lost, but I think you just have to get out to the horizon. I'm not sure, but I mean, it's it's definitely close. We'll have to ask like some endgame expert, Karsten Mueller or something. But I make the worst move now, h4. This is just stupid. I mean, I'd have no time to get down and behind. It was just totally fa fantasy. I have to try to activate my king, you know, like king f7, a4, king e7. Um, Maybe that's inaccurate. Maybe I should trade pawns. I don't know. Okay, pawn takes pawn. Pawn takes pawn. King e7. Can I save this position, though? Maybe. If my king is in the game, and he has three isolated pawns, and I get my rook down in behind, I guess there's a chance. Um, not sure. But this is just really bad. And then h4, and now I'm totally lost. Rook c5, rook c4, rook d5, check here. Yeah, he figures out to go this way. Obviously, Rook there doesn't do anything. He just plays e4. So I'm lost. It's not even close. But I just played on out of momentum. Anyway, that was my last round game from the World Senior. So it was an endgame disaster. Um, but as most of my endgame disasters go, it followed the same basic premise, which was that I'm not a moron in endgames. I'm just not good at playing endgames fast. If I have enough time, I'm okay, but I've lost like five or six endgames that I shouldn't have lost in the last, I don't know, two years. Because I just don't, you know, I don't have enough time. I mean, I'm trying to defend this endgame from like, you know, move 40, whatever. Move, uh... If we go back to pre-move 40, I was, uh... I was down to, when I made my first blunder, like here, I had four minutes for five moves. So my advice to you guys is, if you're not really especially good at end games, don't get in time pressure. And try to find FIDE tournaments where there's like three time controls, because I'm just like hemorrhaging rating points at, uh, at like, you know, dropping games against Grandmasters where I should have held a draw. This guy, you know, he, he didn't really do anything, and uh, except just kind of move around and wait for me to lose on time. But I managed to find a way to do it. Not to take away from him, he's a good player, but uh, but the exchange French with, you know, with the, uh, the Petrov with, with D3, I mean, that's really bad. 
anyways, thanks guys for watching. Um, thanks for the follow and uh, for the for the new players who followed from the the um, the raid we got from Casper. And thanks to Astrobay for your gift subs. I appreciate it, guys. Um, the next stream will be tomorrow. Um, surprisingly, yes, tomorrow, Friday morning. Thanks, IBYM, for being here as well. I didn't mention you. Um, you typed in subs. I don't think we have a subs command. Do not follow me. I am an idiot. Um, surrounded by, I'm surrounded by idiots. That's a book. But anyway, um, yeah, if you hang out with people who, you know, who are idiots, you become an idiot. They dumb you down to their level. Uh, but anyway, I, I will see you guys. Um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. I, I do want to share some of my, more of my games with from the World Senior, but this one like was the last round. It was the most disappointing. Um, I had some other interesting games. We can go over those later. Anyway, thanks everyone for tuning in. I will see you 11.30 uh, a.m. tomorrow morning. I'm going to take some fast rapid challenges. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye-bye.